It requires nothing more than you going within yourself and being willing to look at yourself and figure out the narratives that you've been telling yourself that are limited in scope. They're not necessarily wrong. Mm -hmm. They're just one right. facet. Right. And you know, the difference between facet and fact is only that letter E. And I always think of that from a mathematical perspective because I love math. And E is a mathematical constant called the Euler number. Mm. And it's just like pi. So it, it's, it makes squares instead of making circles. You can think of it like that. Mm -hmm. so, but for every circle, there must be a square also, mm -hmm. right? For every feminine, there must be a masculine. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. So when you think of these terms, okay, so I've got E and Euler is 2.718. Pi is 3.14. We learned that in school. My birthday. Yeah. The two work together to make a triangle. So if I have a triangle with pi as its sides, the height is going to be approximately the Euler number. Mm. The height of the triangle, the mm. unseen part, mm. right? So if I cut that triangle in half, right. it's an equilateral triangle. But Euler is unique because 271. Okay, 271. Well, the word Euler is named after a Swiss mathematician named Leonard Euler. Euler actually means, it's spelled E-U-L-E-R, but pronounced Euler, like mm -hmm. oil. Mm -hmm. Oil, in German, Euler, means owl. Civilize the mind, make savage the body. This is the Civil Mind, Savage Body Podcast, and I'm your host, Mike Rasheed King. We will explore and discuss ways to expand consciousness, increase your health, reverse aging, and refine our lifestyles to live a life in an abundance. Now, we're currently aware of three dimensions, but as technology and human intellect advances, consciously tapping into the fourth dimension is inevitable. Three dimensions of space, one dimension of time. That extra dimension is a degree of freedom. However, can we travel back in time? I don't think so. But is that accurate? Or are we looking at this the wrong way? Let's say you wanted to find me, right? You have to know my exact location, and you have to know when I'm there. Is time just a construct, or is it as natural as the air that we breathe? One thing that I'm certain of is I don't know. I don't believe anything. I either know or I don't know. But hopefully together, we'll all find out. Enjoy the show. Today's episode of Civil Mind Savage Body Podcast, I'd like to talk to you about what a philomath is. A philomath is one who loves to learn. Phylos in Greek means lover, and math simply means learn. We now consider math to be only an aspect of learning, and that's only things in regards to numbers. However, math is all learning. Think about the low-hanging fruit when it comes to math. Logical reasoning, critical thinking, creative thinking, abstract thinking, spatial thinking, problem solving, and communication skills. Math and specifically geometry is the framework to the universe. Math and sacred geometry is the language of God. Now let me tell you about today's guest, Robert Edward Grant. He's the founder, chairman, and CEO of Crown Sterling Limited. He's also the co-founder and chairman of Access Elite Health. He also is the chairman and managing partner of Strathspeak Crown LLC, which is a growth equity firm that manages 15 separate subsidiary companies and investment assets. That's very impressive, but I didn't come across him due to any business connections. I was told about him from one of my closest friends, Maya. She's very spiritual and tends to protect me by pointing me in the direction of places and people that she know that I'd align with. Now, Mr. Grant and I met last week and we had lunch. We went on an odyssey of various topics. Life, death, evolution of man, ascending and accessing higher dimensions, space exploration, what is life, what is death, what is evolution, what is space. We actually accessed dimension four and we peeked into dimension five. We spoke for about three hours on today's episode. We spent about four hours together last week. We spent approximately 432 minutes together so far. Remember, four, three, two. That's an interesting number. I learned from Rob that 432 is the only whole number whose square is very close to the speed of light in miles and seconds. The sun's radius is 432,000 miles. 432 hertz is said to be mathematically consistent with the patterns of the universe. 432 hertz vibrate with the universe's golden mean phi and unifies the properties of light, time, space, matter, gravity, and magnetism with biology. 
That's the DNA code and consciousness. Needless to say, this is going to be a very, very interesting episode. So I hope y'all take notes, hit pause when you need to to write things down, Google fact checked, all of that. But please enjoy today's episode. Let's go. I want to back up to something you mentioned. Sex okay. magic. Oh, geez. Let's not start with that. No? <laughs> is it too much? Is it it's too, too much climatic? So we had we we some foreplay. Okay. That's fair. That's fair. <laughs> a date. We got a date first, right? That's right. So I have, I have a lot of questions for you. Okay. Mathematics being the language of the universe. Mm -hmm. Is that an accurate statement? 100%. Okay. How is that? Well, if you look at the fabric of everything that is, mm -hmm. right? It is based on a numerical sort of data set of information. Right. And actually information is about to be proven to be the quote unquote fifth state of matter. Now, whether you agree with the fifth state of matter as a concept or not, uh, University of Portsmouth is actually gonna prove using what they call uh, gamma photon annihilation, which basically comes as a result of a positron that mm -hmm. is linked up with its you know, pair, uh, entangled pair, which is called an electron. Mm -hmm. And the positron kind of cycles down from the future towards the present, mm -hmm. and the electron goes from the past towards the future. And where they meet, the two basically annihilate each other. We call that moment now. Mm -hmm. And when they annihilate each other, there is a certain amount of information, right? A certain amount of energy that's right. emitted uh, from any kind of photon, um, uh, gamma photon annihilation, you're gonna have that. And so by measuring the amount of energy and resultant information, mm -hmm. then we can prove that actually one of the states of matter, if you believe this theory, will be proven to be information. So how is information cohered becomes the question. Mm -hmm. So information must be at the basis of everything. And actually there is a whole theory in physics called um, you know, energy, um, mass, and information equivalency. Mm -hmm. So energy, mass, information, equivalency. So that means that they're all equal in a way, mm -hmm. right? They're, they're, you make changes to them, but effectively, and it's sort of like X and one over X relationships, effectively it will prove that they're all the same thing. So the way information coheres itself is through geometry. Mm -hmm. And geometry is mathematics. Okay. So everything we see in the universe, whether it be a DNA, uh, you know, nucleotide pair, is based on a pentagon, and two hexagons, mm -hmm. right? So a pentagon and two hexagons makes up adenine, thymine, and cytosine and guanine. Right. And so that is all life. So in biology, that's how it basically represents itself. In, in the structure of space-time itself, gravity, if there is a quantization of gravity or quantum gravity, then it's gonna have to be based on a numerical information, right? That right. numerical information is gonna inform how galaxies are made, how they're structured, why they stay suspended in place. Mm -hmm. And if that's the case, you could take that all the way down through fractal geometry down to the subatomic scales. So basically the underlying structure of everything is a mathematical matrix. Right. And I you know, originally in Greece, the original name for mathematics didn't mean the study of quantity or the science of mm -hmm. quantity. It was Aristotle who was a botanist who gave it that more narrow definition. Mm -hmm. The original definition for it was all learning. So mathematics, and to be a polymath or a philomath, as you see my, my book right. on, your, on your coffee table here, mm -hmm. uh, means to be a, you know, a polymath is many learnings, right? right? A philomath is lover. Philo means lover. Like philosophy is right. lover of wisdom because okay. it's philosophia, okay. right? So a philomath is a lover of learning. Mm -hmm. and, and so when you think about learning is the contextual basis of, of what we think of as mathematics, mm -hmm. it used to be much broader than just this science of quantity that we narrowed it down to today because of Aristotle's way of looking at the world. Right, it's interesting you say it was much broader, but it's still broad just being- It's super broad already. Right. Mm -hmm. So, okay. So Aristotle, the Greeks, all of this stuff is really fascinating. However, we're, we never hear about their teachers. Right, but I know that a couple years ago, if I understand correctly, I mean, you were already a, a very established, well, a uh, successful uh, businessman, mm -hmm. and you went, you took a trip somewhere to Egypt, and mm -hmm. it changed your life. Yeah, absolutely. How so? Well, I, you know, I'd already been before I went to Egypt. I'd already been to over 135 countries. Right. So I'd seen the world. 
I okay. lived in nine countries and I learned eight languages, five wow. of which I, I, I learned to speak fluently. Right. And I thought I had a pretty good grip on, you know, kind of like living in this world right. and how to succeed in this world, how right. to manifest. I even gave a TED talk on how to manifest, how to overcome fear. And overcoming fear is not about having an absence of fear. People mm. often confuse that. Okay. You, know, you know, danger is real, but fear becomes right. a choice for us. I think you probably okay. would agree with that. So that's that's dealing with the amygdala. Yeah, exactly. Getting past the reptilian kind of brain, de deactivating it. Right. Sense, right. How do you bypass the 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 amygdala? It's interesting. The reptilian I had, brain. I had a conversation with a fella last week in here, and he was equating the functions of the amygdala with things like social issues like someone about to be evicted and i was like no and th but this is interesting in my studies of the amygdala is very ancient reptile brain limbic system but there's a level of consciousness to the amygdala from what i was reading that our amygdala can start detecting immediate danger before we're conscious of it which is interesting Oh, absolutely. It's just like animals know that there's going to be an earthquake before the earthquake comes. Right. That's why they start heading for higher ground. Mm -hmm. right? And I had a friend, um, one of my friends, actually, his wife suffered a stroke. And she lost her ability to bypass the amygdala. Mm -hmm. So she would be cooking dinner. She was otherwise fine after she had the right. stroke. But she'd be cooking dinner and she'd burn her finger. Wow. And she would run out of the kitchen jump in her car and drive five miles down the street Wow! because she triggered the flight response. Right. So at a very basic level, you know, we, we have the same embryonic profile. You look at it. We look mm. similar to a salamander until we get to a certain right. stage of development, yeah. right, as an embryo. Yeah. We, st we, we still come from, right, at a base sense, these lower dimensional forms of ourselves, right? right? And so as a result, it is only through being able to learn how to bypass and we mm -hmm. do it through life. We do it naturally. We, we, we don't get afraid because we burn our finger and we jump it, in our car. I guess we do it from learning. We do it from learning. Yeah. Exactly. We do mm -hmm. it from learning. And learning is all conscious expansion. So you could say that mathematics is the basis of conscious expansion. Mm -hmm. right? It's through experiential learning that we're experiencing it. Mm -hmm. And we don't even realize that mathematics is all around us. Right. It's in everything. Yeah, right, it's it's an emotion. We can apply mathematical principles of ratio mm -hmm. to emotions, mm -hmm. even to duality itself. Right. So math is applied to everything in physics. There's nothing that it couldn't be applied to. Math and music are the same thing. Geometry is just the music that we listen to with our eyes. Right. Right. So and and so I think that going to Egypt for me. Yeah. Right. Going back to your question, going to Egypt for me was felt like a super homecoming mm -hmm. for me. The first time I went, and I'd had sort of this dream of going to Egypt my whole life. Right. And for some reason, I was supposed to go in 2010 on this long trip, and uh, and there was a big, you know, they had a problem at that time with uh, the shooting of a bus full of, like, German tourists. Mm, okay. And it was this terrorist attack that happened then, and so I, I wasn't able to go to Egypt at that time. But I was really happy in 2017 to be able to go. Mm -hmm. And it completely changed my life. Mm -hmm. And also, I think the next place you were going with that question was who taught the, the Greek philosophers. And mm -hmm. I think that all of the knowledge came out of the Egyptian mystery schools. Mm -hmm. And you know, Pythagoras spent many, many years uh, I think in it was eight Egypt. to be exact. Mm -hmm. the, the education process was 20 years, mm -hmm. but no foreigners had ever spent the entire 20. Pythagoras yeah. did, right. Pythagoras spent a ton of time there. Okay. And he, he ended up... Um, you know, taking a lot away from his learnings, but you know, then he created the Pythagorean school, right? Uh, and mm -hmm. his and his own followers as well. But they were right. all about number because they understood right. that all is number. You right. know that that quote is sometimes attributed to Plato, but it's actually originally from Pythagoras. Hey, check this out! I want to invite you if you're a personal trainer and you are trading your time for money, and you realize that it's impossible for you to scale that way because it's only a finite amount of time that you have each day. If you want to expand your reach and help more people, if you wanna make more money, a potentially unlimited amount, I have the solution for you. It's called the Rich Trainer Challenge. It's a five day challenge. I will be teaching you the tactics that I personally used and employed over the years to grow my personal training business to a multi-million dollar online training business, okay? Stop trading your time for money. 
it's impossible for you to become financially free that way. All right, I'm going to teach you our real sovereignty. So don't wait. Sign up right now. It's the first link down below. I'm also randomly choosing people who sign up today to give them a thousand dollars cash. All right. You could be the one. Now, I'm going to teach you how to make money, but I'm also going to give you money. That's a win win situation. Let's get it. Plato's more popular. Plato's more known in some mm -hmm. ways, but Pythagoras, um, you know, it was quite a bit of time between Plato and Pythagoras. You know, right. Pythagoras was around, I think it was the late uh, fifth century BC. Okay. And, um, and when you look at the timeline of Plato, it was about 380 mm -hmm. BC. Right. So, you know, it's a couple hundred years about right. that, the, that separate the two minds, but, but Plato definitely studied Pythagoras. Right. And Pythagoras gave us what we now understand about music mm -hmm. and what we understand not only about music but also mathematics right. so you know and a lot of people would say well wait a minute did pythagoras really come up with the pythagorean theorem i don't believe he did right i mean but, it's clear that he didn't because it's in the pyramids yeah it's clear that he didn't because it's in the pyramids mm -hmm. a b it's also clear that he didn't because there's something called plimpton 322 which is mm -hmm. a plate a sumerian plate that was discovered not long ago mm -hmm that is actually outlining trigonometry. So mm -hmm. the basis of trigonometry is the study of right triangles. Right. And, and the Pythagorean theory is, is fundamental to that study. So it's clear that the Sumerians, the ancient Sumerians had it, you know, uh, more than a thousand years prior to Pythagoras. Mm -hmm. But we have to credit Pythagoras for keeping good records. Right. right. Because at the end of the day, and people ask me this all the time, it's like, oh, you know, didn't he steal that knowledge from another place? I don't think knowledge can be stolen. Mm -hmm. Right. I don't. I, I believe that knowledge is is supposed to be shared. Right. right? It's a. It's like a, a universal right as a human being to understand right. the language of the universe. Right. And all of us can access it, but the knowledge of how to access it is unique and esoteric mm -hmm. and mysterious sometimes. Right. I think that going to the Egyptian mystery schools was critical for Pythagoras to be able to tap in to accessing this higher knowledge, not only what he learned in Egypt, but also what he could effectively get access to mm -hmm. for the rest of his life. Right. After he left Egypt as well. Right. I got a question for you. So me personally, I've, I always say I lived a thousand lives, right? Because as a kid, I played chess and I box and they're very similar. And in that you have to, you know, do you play chess? I do, yeah. Okay, so every move you're thinking about the counter, how you can counter, mm -hmm. so on and so forth. And it, it doesn't have to end how many processes that you think through. So I, I just happen to do that with everything, right? Mm -hmm. When I was a kid, I thought I ruined everything because I thought about it already, right? But <laughs> nonetheless, I've been, like literally lived a thousand lives because I've lived on so many different planes of existence socially, right? So I've been around people who, you know, they're only, I, I would say they're kind of primitive. And what I mean by that is a human, we're an animal, right? But I look at it like there's a spectrum of when we were just an animal to where we developed that frontal lobe and that cerebral cortex, all the way to a, a very intelligent, ethical, evolved person, right? but there's still a spectrum. And I feel like a lot of people's way down here on the spectrum, mm -hmm. that they're still primitive in that they only care about survival, right? And, and the Olympic system is strong, yeah. you know? So why do we exist in a world like that? Do you think that, because the things that you, you and I are talking about, the levels that I know that you're on intellectually, most people will go through life without even think not understanding it not even hearing this kind of information right mm -hmm. why do we live in a world with such vast uh uh differences in human intellect and i i would i would i want to say it uh different like these people are three-dimensional beings but sub fully three-dimensional mm -hmm. 2.7 2.4 you know what i mean why is that well, I think, first of all, you know, Maslow came out with something that he coined the Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Mm -hmm. And it's shaped like a pyramid. So I'm looking at the pyramid right in front of me on your right. wall, a uh, picture of Caffrey Pyramid. And the pyramid at its base has sort of like the basic human needs, food, shelter, right? What do I need to survive? Mm -hmm. But you, you have a hard time thinking beyond like one step ahead, two steps ahead, three steps ahead, like you right. do in chess, mm -hmm. if you're constantly trying to find your food. 
Right. If you're constantly trying to find your shelter for the night, it's hard for you to get strategic mm-hmm. about things, mm-hmm. right? So it's, uh, it's about ascending this sort of hierarchy and overcoming these basic needs as a society and as individual humans and as collective as well. And of course, there are other things like belonging and sexual relations, the need to procreate and have children and all these things. And then finally, you get up to this higher level, which is about manifestation and what is called Mm self-actualization. So that means that you can start to think strategically. You're you're escaping the amygdala Mm -hmm. and going from the reptilian brain to the prefrontal cortex, Mm -hmm. right? So if you, you've probably seen the photograph of the Sistine Chapel, where it shows God reaching out to Adam like this, right. right? And then if you actually look at it, it's kind of interesting because the shape of God's body, the shape of his legs and everything are mirror imaging Adam, mm. who's on the ground, kind of laying back and pointing out too, as right. well. And if you look at where God's head is, God's head is in the prefrontal cortex of the structure that's around him, the superstructure around him looks like curtains, but it's mm. actually a brain. Wow. It's half of a brain. Wow. <laughs> So it's a brain hemisphere. And when you look at it, you could see it. There's a clear cerebellum. There's a clear brain stem. You could see it all perfectly. And his brain is right on top of the prefrontal cortex because this is where your God mind can actually evolve towards. Mm -hmm. So as you move to these higher levels of consciousness, you can start to move your thought process from the you know, base of your brain, which Mm -hmm. is really that amygdala, that reptilian centaur. It's like, I'm gonna fight or flight, right? right? I'm gonna get out of here, I'm gonna fight and go for it. And then you get to higher order reasoning and creativity. Mm -hmm. So you can solve problems that come up, right? right? I saw this quote recently that wasn't, uh, it was kind of profound because it was like, you know, we're not here to choose our lives Rather, we're here to understand why we chose what we chose, mm-hmm. which implied already that we choose all of it. Mm-hmm. So if you think about this from a higher self perspective, so in Maslow's hierarchy of needs, you get up to self-actualization, but few people know that Maslow actually had a higher level than that, that he was mm-hmm. intending to put in this pyramid. So you mm-hmm. can think of it as the missing pyramidian on Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Mm-hmm. And that missing pyramidian was actually titled self-transcendence. Mm-hmm. When you start to realize that you can overcome this notion of your duality and this notion of your separation from everybody else, right. this idea that you are, it's like this African phrase. I just did a podcast with, uh, with Queen Diambi, who is the mm-hmm. queen of the people, the, the tribal people of the Congo. Okay. Right, in the center of Africa. It's a wonderful woman. I spent, she was in Egypt with me a few oh, months wow. ago. And um, it's an amazing story. And we were talking on this podcast about the concept of Ubuntu, right? Which really means I am because you are. Hmm. I am because you are. Okay. It's a very ascended and high consciousness concept because what it actually embodies is this notion that we're not all separate we are, in a sense, each other. In a Mm -hmm. way, you could say that the experiences that I'm experiencing in my outward world are really just the inverse of what's in my inner world. So the feelings and emotions that I'm carrying, the karma that I'm carrying, the things that I'm afraid of, right, end up appearing as projections in my outward world. And I experience life in this way. So I think when you ask the question, why is it that some people are more evolved than others? I think it has a lot to do with two things. Number one, how do we know, right, that as their higher selves, that we're already fully ascended, and that maybe as a process of becoming more ascended, we end up choosing an avatar experience in this world. And all the experiences that we experience, maybe because we want to learn and expand. Because if the goal of consciousness is the ultimate expansion, the universe is always expanding, the way we will do it is through experiential learning. So, you know, I'm a believer more and more, you know, the latest Nobel Prize that was just given points more and more to a notion of a holographic universe, a holograph of experience. And even though it was more oriented around quantum computing and what you can now do with, you know, this notion of entanglement Mm -hmm. and measurement, related to that, um, I think what it's actually pointing us more and more towards is this model of quantum physics, 
which says that Heisenberg's uncertainty principle says that we, each of us, have a huge impact on what's happening in the world around us. We just don't know it. Right. Okay. And so, the stages of knowing and not knowing is this level of progression of consciousness. Not knowing. All right. I got so many questions on what you said. But one of them is this. If we are choosing an, an avatar, right? Mm -hmm. So what happens to the recollection of these, these events? Why, don't, why are we not cognizant of it or conscious of it or remember it? Well, you like chess, right? Yes. Okay. So any game environment, mm -hmm. if you really want it to stick, you got to make that thing super real. Okay. You got to make it so real that everybody believes it's real. And the only way you could accomplish that for people that already know it is to cut their memory of it. Mm -hmm. So put those memories behind higher dimensions that have to be unraveled. It's like peeling back an onion. Mm -hmm. And as we get higher and higher up on our level of understanding of who we are, we remember each passing day more and more who we are and why we are here. Why did we choose the things we chose? You know, as I look back on my life, the bad things that have happened to me, the worst things that have happened mm -hmm. to me, I can tell you right now, even the most terrible circumstances that I experienced, I look back now with the eye of retrospect mm -hmm. and I see them as having served a purpose, mm -hmm. that they brought me to where I am. And very often those worst failures I ever experienced led to my biggest successes. Well, I have a perspective on that. Mm -hmm. I have a thing that I say, only good things happen to me, right? Mm -hmm. So let's talk about ego, right? People say, especially when dealing with sacred medicine, you dissolve your ego, you have an ego death, right? Mm -hmm. So I've taken a heroic journey and I was very aware of my ego mm -hmm. and I, I, I had no intentions on killing my ego because it's very, it, it helps me in so many ways. Yeah. Now I can sit it to the side and I, matters of the heart, love, I don't deal with ego, mm -hmm. but everything else I do, right? And I think it benefits a lot of people now. Me saying only good things happen to me is egotistical, right? So, and I say that because of this. I've learned my defense mechanism for whenever I make a bad decision or do something I shouldn't and I attract a diseased situation to myself. I deal with it, but I'll never succumb to it really. I'm like, mm, this is good. I oh, and I, you could literally make good out of anything and I always have. So I agree with that. Yeah. So nothing bad ever happens to me. To me, life is very easy, super easy. It's like they say life is what you make it like. That's such a profound statement because it literally is the simplest quotes like that is so real to me, you know, but and I and I, I talk to so many people and I'm just like, life is what you make it like. Don't you understand that? Oh, yeah. literally. So here's, here's another <laughs> so thing. So true, man. So. All right. So here we are in this world. And I have a, I, I sit and thought about certain things a lot. I sit and thought about how I'm perceived in the, the professional world. When I'm in board meetings, I'm meeting people, this and the third, right? And it's very interesting. A lot of people are kind of uncomfortable around me because they don't know how to take me, right? So I'm like, okay, that's cool. I'll use it to my advantage, whatever, right? And, and I try, you know, some people are like, Man, when you're real quiet, you're intimidating everybody. I'm like, bro, I'm just chilling. Like, I'm just me. <laughs> but here's the thing. I, I asked a friend of mine. I, I apologized to him before I asked this question. Mm -hmm. But this guy's a really good guy. I love him to death, right? Very successful. Millionaire. But not a billionaire. I said, yo, if you, I don't know, if, let's say $50, $50 billion, would you have sex with so-and-so's wife? He said, yes, without even thinking about it. I said, okay. I said, I'm not judging you. I don't know what that feels like to be tempted with that kind of money, right? But I know that a person can justify $50 billion doing something so well, heinous. Maybe right? I might say yes if it was, well, if I weren't married. But I might say yes <laughs> if the person offering me the money was her husband. <laughs> nah, nah, it's not going to be an easy, a easy uh, thing. So, so here's the thing. So. You know, and then I think about matters of like, like think about this world. Think about the United States. We're the, we're the Don Dadas, right? Mm -hmm. We're the spot. Why? We have money, we have, and we have violence. We're the most violent, right? So I'm like, 
it feels like to me, and feelings are just feelings, but I don't know this, but it's just a notion that God, to most people, is violence and money. Because people really respect power. power. Even like, okay, so when I, my first time like spending time out of the country, mm-hmm. I was in the United Arab Emirates. Um, I was out there for about a year, but I traveled all over, all over the region. Mm-hmm. And I seen, you learn the world from a different perspective, not yeah. from our lens. Mm-hmm. And our lens is very skewed and very curated, right? So you see reality in these different places. And one, one thing that I saw was like, wow, we do some fucked up shit. But my thought was, but I'm glad I'm on that team. I'm glad I'm American, you know, because my visas, my passport is golden out here, right? Um, so I felt like my parents were drug dealers and killers, but I'm glad that my parents, because we're the strongest, nobody can mm-hmm. mess with me, you know? And I, I like to consider myself an ethical person, but I'm not like cursing the United States and wanting to leave, and I'm not trying to fix anything. I mean, I'm trying to, I do my best to be a good person and let that spread to those around me, but I'm not running campaigns and, you know, doing anything meaningful to stop what I perceive as atrocities that we commit around the world, yeah. right? Mm-hmm. So, and nobody is from what I can see. Totally. So are we complicit to violence and the pursuit of money? Are we, uh, is God really, is money and violence God to, to, to most people? You know, again, I think it was Wayne Dyer who says, when you change how you see things, the things you see change. Mm. And I think it's a very powerful concept because literally anything that happens to you, whether it was the best thing in the world or the worst thing in the world, it will be what you believed it to be. Mm-hmm. So if you think you can or you think you can't, you You're will right. be right. Yeah. Okay. And that's a Henry Ford comment. So and a, and a Yoda comment. Yeah, and a Yoda yeah. comment too. Yeah. Exactly. It's like my favorite scene in in Star Wars: uh, Empire Strikes Back when mm-hmm. the Yoda pulls out the X fighter from the swamp, mm-hmm. and then Luke Skywalker says, "Master, I don't believe it." And he goes, "And that is why you fail, mm-hmm. right?" And it really comes down to this: we don't realize how powerful mm-hmm. our thoughts, our words, and our actions are linked together. Mm-hmm. And actually, you could even argue that the entire circumstance changes from the moment we start thinking, mm-hmm. right? It's, it's like another line from Shakespeare that's a great one, which is something like, uh, whether good or bad, thinking makes it so. Yeah. Right? Mm-hmm. What we think we're experiencing is what we ultimately will experience. Because in life, we don't get necessarily what we deserve. But we almost always get what we expected to get. Well, what does deserve mean? So that's my point. Deserve is another lens Mm -hmm. of perspective on, you know, if I have a mentality of entitlement, the only thing I will do if I'm thinking, man, I don't have this. I'm focused on what others have and I don't have. And this was actually a study done at Harvard Business School. Mm -hmm. And what they asked everybody was for graduates. You have two scenarios. You can pick A or B. Which scenario would you rather choose? In scenario A... You're going to make two hundred and ten thousand dollars, but all your peers in your class, the same same graduating class, will make two hundred thousand dollars a year in salary, right? You've spent all this time and money. You have half a million dollars in debt, probably, mm-hmm. to go to school like Harvard Business School, and also your undergrad. You have to still cover that cost as well, and so all dollars are constant across both scenarios. Okay, mm-hmm. scenario B is you make a hundred and fifty thousand dollars a year but all your classmates make $140,000 a year. Now you would think these students are the smartest in business because they went to Harvard Business School. They should be pretty smart, right? And everyone would choose the $200,000 versus everyone else in their class making $210,000. Guess what they all chose? B. 87% chose B. Mm -hmm. Because for most of the world, we tend to think in terms of comparative economics rather than absolute economics. Even though there's purchase power parity between having $210,000 or $200,000 a year versus having $140,000 or $150,000 because it was more than another person Mm -hmm. in your class, that seemed more attractive. So we have this mentality very often that's built into, it's not far from the amygdala, it's probably slightly above the amygdala, but we have this mentality of what I don't have. 
And we tend to see the world in terms of what I don't have. Now, this is a catch. And this is a big, big fatal catch. Because the people that make all the money in the world generally, and there are some exceptions to this, but the ones who consistently make it and don't just lose it right away mm -hmm. are the people that focus on what they already have. And they feel gratitude for what they already have. Mm -hmm. And that replicates and creates abundance because the universe only understands what you're feeling, right? Mm -hmm. From the perspective of, you know, universe doesn't know. Like if I'm looking every day and saying, I don't want to be fat, I don't want to be fat, I don't want to be fat, I don't want to be fat. Versus, I want to be thin, I want to be thin, I want to be thin, I want to be thin. Mm -hmm. What will happen is the universe only hears the word fat. Right. Right. So what gets replicated back to you is what you didn't want, mm -hmm. what you were afraid of actually getting. Right. So people that feel entitled, right, they are constantly thinking about what they don't have. So then they don't actually do well with what they do have. And then very often they just end up with less and less and less. And then that creates a self-fulfilling prophecy. It's a cycle mm -hmm. of entitlement. Someone who thinks that the world is against them and I feel like a victim. Oh, woe is me. I'm always victimized. Well, guess what? You've just become a hammer that's looking for a nail that you've titled victimization of yourself. And this is the problem that happens in society over and over and over again. And again, it's about realizing where we play in our conscious mind. Can we connect to our subconscious mind to then actually bring forward the outcomes and the results and see anything that happens? You know, one time I got fired. I got fired. It was a terrible thing. Mm -hmm. And it was, it really was like one of the worst days of my life. I threw up on the airplane on the way home from mm -hmm. going to New York on it and everything. And I had, you know, left a really fabulous job for this. And it wasn't a firing because I deserved to get fired. It was a firing because they changed their policy of what they wanted. The, the, the owners of the company, a large private equity fund, they didn't want to sell. They didn't want to take the company public. So they decided to sell it to a big pharma. And I was like, that doesn't leave any place for me. I don't want to be here for this. Mm -hmm. So I left the company. And the next morning I woke up, went out to pick up the newspaper when we still had newspapers. And I went out to pick it up and I reached down. I remember thinking, today can be the worst day of my life. Or I can choose that it will be the best. Right. And later that day I founded my company, which you mm -hmm. came to visit. Right. right now I have 17 companies in that portfolio. Right. It was the best thing I ever did. Mm -hmm. You know, I've had ups and downs and challenges and difficulties like anybody has in being an entrepreneur and running businesses. But, you know, 10 years later, I'm still here. And so are all of our companies. Mm -hmm. And what I want to say about this is that what we experience in this life is not what actually happens to us. It's what we believe happen to us. It's the narrative that we tell ourselves. If we tell ourselves, you don't have enough, you're never enough. You're, you're constantly picked on. You're constantly a victim. You will be that thing. Mm -hmm. And if you tell yourself the opposite, I'm great. I'm strong. You're not, this is not about ego. You know, mm -hmm. narcissism is not true self-love. Mm -hmm. We say that we have a narcissistic society, mm -hmm. you know, selfies and all that. That's not true self-love. What that really yeah. is, is self-loathing. Mm -hmm. It's loving only one aspect of who you are. Right. And only wanting to show that aspect of who you are. So you're going to do the makeup. It's going to be the filter. It's going to be the right. whatever to make you look better or bigger mm -hmm. or stronger. And sometimes it's more powerful just to accept who we are, even it's, all of our vulnerabilities. No, there's a lot. It's so much beauty in one sitting firmly in their truth. Totally. You know, I had, um, once again, when I did that heroic journey, it was like an 18-hour ordeal. 18 it was, hours. It was very transformative. What was it? What, what? LSD. Like LSD, wow. Well. Yeah. And it was the best day of my life. But I, I was so firmly planted in loving myself and my truth. You know, it made, it, made, it made everything so much easier, all my decision making so much easier. You know, it made me say the things that I really want to say to people, right? Whether it's, whether they want to hear it or not, it's okay. Because even if you're upset with me, you're going to appreciate my honesty at some point. And it always happens like that. So, so yeah, uh, a lot of things to unpack. But I want to ask you, I want okay. to get to, mm -hmm. to something else with you. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, are people who are somewhat evolved and aware and can consciously use their subconscious as a tool, just like using your amygdala and fight or flight, 
uh, uh, constructively. Are people like this smarter than the universe? I'm asking, I'm gonna tell you why I say that. Because you said something that stood out to me. The universe being as vast as it, as it is, mm -hmm. it seems like it's kind of primitive in its, in, or fixed with its uh, abilities with how it does things. It can't see this, it can only see that, right? Mm -hmm. So are evolved people smarter than the universe? I don't know that I would say, so I guess in my belief system, I believe that, I don't believe that there's like this God who is this dude in a white outfit. Right? <laughs> right. In <laughs> the not, clouds. Yeah, in the clouds. Yeah. You know, whether he's black or white. I don't believe it's like one person like right, this. I right. believe the entire universe is God. Including I believe, us. Including us. So that means you are God. Okay, but I'm gonna stop you. I'm sorry for stopping you, but mm -hmm. God, right? Someone came up with this notion and like in the Bible where it says we God created us in his image. I'm like, we created God in our image. Because why? That's I think a very, we're calling, very profound comment you just I made. I think we're calling what we're learning, which is the universe, God, because it's a word called God that has been in religion, which really was just the sun initially. And it will make sense for the sun to be God to us mm -hmm. humans, right? Mm -hmm. But as we learn more, we see the sun is small in the big mm -hmm. scheme of things. Like a lot of times, I don't know, I challenge things, not not for the sake of challenging, but I'm like, why are we stopping there? So why are we putting God on things, right? Because God, it's not some, a guy came up with that, that whole concept, I think. Yeah, no, God as a concept, I think has been, it fell in the same category as all other things that get separated from mm, us. Right. I think that the entire universe is God expressing itself. And, and it is divine. Right. And it is ordered. It's just as ordered as it is chaotic. Right. There, there is always balance in this universe. There must always be, you know, for every action, an equal opposite reaction, as well, Isaac Newton I, I said. I guess is not understanding the order is chaos to that person. That's right. Yeah. And I mean, I believe that there's no such thing as randomness. Mm -hmm. I believe there's only things that we haven't perceived yet. So I, I, I call that God's encryption, right? It's like, right. oh yeah, it's like what we call randomness is actually just God's encryption that we haven't perceived yet. Right. We cannot comprehend because we're not in that consciousness level. And when I say that, it's really the, the entire all dimensions mm -hmm. of the universe level, right. right? So I fundamentally believe that each and every one of us has the ability to have a God realization. I agree. I don't know. I, I do agree that a lot, not a lot, some do, but I say some because so many people die without even getting close to Yeah, that's that. true, that is true. But but again, maybe, and someone would, it's difficult to say this, it's difficult to understand this, because it's like, well, how would someone choose to die? You know, the Hindus believe that we are born with a certain number of breaths, and all of that was chosen by the universal source of which you are part of. We are all just separations of the number one. Maybe there's only one, and we're all just divisions of that number one. And you could have infinite we, we, divisions. You have to be, if yeah. you think about it, because especially when you're thinking about like law correspondence, mm -hmm. I mean, we have billions of microbes in our bodies right now. Yeah. That's probably conscious to an extent, mm -hmm. but has no aware that they're not aware that you and I are talking. That that's even a thing. It's yeah. probably weather. Like this is an earthquake to them. You know what I mean? Yeah. So the flavor of our food, twenty percent or so of that is insects, mm -hmm. right? So everything is connected and not conscious of it. But we're so weird that we're conscious of these things. Yeah. I mean, when you when you brush your teeth in the morning, if you use fluoride toothpaste, I don't. But if you do, I mean, that's basically stardust. Mm -hmm. We are we are the stuff of the universe. Right. We're breathing in the same air that Napoleon breathed in. Okay, right? so information. I'm gonna go back to the beginning of the conversation. Um, DNA. Mm -hmm. I believe, if I'm not mistaken, Matt, can you look this up? We have about 250 petabytes of information in our DNA. Mm -hmm. A petabyte is the equivalent of 50 billion pages of like like the size of the, the yep. this book mm -hmm. pages of information on both sides every human has that 
from our understanding, DNA is my parents' information, my grandparents' information. Mm -hmm. How far does that go back, right? So it sounds like, or it seems like, I'll have to study this more, that collectively, you're right, we're all God, we're all everything, we're creation, it's all in us. The story of it is in our DNA, mm -hmm. collectively, right? And no one of us is any better mm -hmm. or any worse than anyone else. But is that true, though? I believe that, I do. Okay. I believe that we're all, we all have the same, we may be born in different circumstances. Right. So I'm not saying, I'm, I'm separating the notion of what someone would think of as better or good okay. or bad, right, from the circumstance that you're born into. I'm just talking about the quality. I don't feel I am any better or any different than anybody else on this planet. Do you feel more capable? Uh, I'm In some areas, I might feel like my unique path of perspective has led me to you know different knowledge of who I am and remembrance of who I am that maybe some people are still asleep to. So I, I definitely believe that. There are people that are very consciously aware and there are people that are not as consciously aware. And that's like the spectrum of a rainbow. You're gonna have you know tons and tons of colors on that. I think that the the issue is that we get stuck into thinking, you know, we take this notion of God into an egocentric place again very easily, right? Because they're like, I'm God. It's like, I'm God. Well, yeah, well, we, we all are, mm -hmm. right? We all are. We're all part of God. You know, Jesus was killed, uh, and I believe he was an ascended master. But he was killed because he was teaching everybody God is within you. It's within each of us. Right? All right, listen, this is crazy. You're right. So there's people who have been banned off of social media for telling young men, you'll be strong, be sovereign, work out, get educated, protect your woman, and they sound too macho, too masculine, they get banned, right? I have, I had a video <laughs> that it was about, um, I have a notion about when people talk about extraterrestrial life, right? They say that we're, we'd be primitive, they'd wipe us out, but I'm like, mm, I don't like that. I think that we're the ones. I think that we're the ones to really, with, I feel like we're the start of all life, personally, um because why not and i think that human beings are so incredible and so powerful and i'm speaking this power to people and youtube uh, monet, uh demonetized it suppressed it and told me i got a message saying this is not suitable for advertisers i'm like what just telling people they're strong they're powerful so it seems there is a narrative there is a a conspiracy and the realest the realest form of that of a stifling of human intellect creativity, power, you know, is someone wants people to stay docile and weak and afraid, you know, and hating each other and just not strong, right? And I feel like it's probably because certain people at the highest parts of certain sectors of society, they don't want to be bothered. They want things to remain the way that it is. They're at the top, everybody else do your thing. You want to hear a horrible story? Yes, about I love that, horrible exactly. Stories. It's one we can we can really learn from. So when I was doing this podcast with Queen Diambi, she was telling her story about how she learned that she was just straight out of like Princess Diaries. If you ever saw Princess Diaries mm -hmm. with Anne Hathaway, you know, she finds out she's like this princess who's gonna become, you know, eventually the queen. Mm -hmm. And Queen Diambi, her father, uh, grew up in the Congo. And he was a tribal leader. But in the Congo, they were colonized by Belgium, and King Leopold, Leopold set up II. this whole, yeah. Mm -hmm. Leopold II set up this really, really oppressive way, and it was, by the way, he was the only of the monarchs who actually owned it himself, as, you know, the colonies were basically split up, and I think it was like 18, it was 1885, I believe, when they did it, and they split up all these colonies and said, okay, you take, you know, Belgium takes this, Netherlands takes this, you know, England mm -hmm. takes this, and it was crazy, right? But the thing about it was that he actually took it for himself personally. It wasn't into the treasury of Belgium, right? right? Not that that would make it any much much better, but right. that's just how everyone else did it at the time. Right. And then he set up really oppressive policies. And in order to control the population in Congo, they set up this concept of an evolved man. And I only learned this this week. Mm. So an evolved man was someone who did all of the things right in society. 
And they could have better housing, access to better jobs. They could become more clerical workers, et cetera, right? Mm -hmm. And so what they did is they divided society by creating a caste. Mm -hmm. And by having a caste and saying that evolved men, right, were able to do things that others couldn't do, then people like her father, Queen Diyami's father, wanted to be an evolved man. And so it's, it's really another way of saying an obedient man, mm -hmm. right? And so if you don't speak out against government, if you don't speak out negatively against things, then you, know, you could get more and more points. This is sounding a lot like a social credit system. It, right? sound, it kind of sounds like the United States these days with cancel culture. This is why I'm bringing it up because mm -hmm. I'm a true believer in free speech. I don't think you can have a society that functions as a, at least under the auspices of democracy without free speech. And what's happened now is we've got this, this cancel culture that's come into society and it's crept in through universities with very liberalistic, you know, far, far left. I'm neither Republican nor Democrat. Same. I'm a middle. I'm a centrist. I'm just me. I'm just me. Yeah. I don't vote for parties. Right. I don't vote for parties. I'll vote for candidates. Yeah. But what, what happened is if you look at right now, if you just Google free speech, when I was growing up, free speech was a positive thing. Mm -hmm. Now, I just Googled free speech b before coming here. Literally, five out of the top 10 articles about it were negative mm -hmm. on free speech. So this is a cancelization. Now, what happened in Belgium, one of the first things they did was they canceled. The reason why Queen Diambi never even knew she was a queen until she, she was 48 years old. Wow. And she was living in Boca Raton. Okay. Wow. And so then she finds out she's got to go be a queen. Wow. She says, I mean, how cra what a crazy story this is, it is, right? Yeah. And one of the most amazing women I've ever met in my whole life, because that moment she got crowned, she's like, she said yes to it, and she didn't know what it meant, right? right. It felt like a huge responsibility. It wasn't like, she, she jokes, she's like, I wasn't the kind of queen that had like, you know, palaces and stuff like this, right? right? Yeah. But I had responsibility, yeah. which I take very seriously. And I bumped into her recently again at the United Nations. So mm -hmm. she's constantly out there advocating. Mm -hmm. She doesn't really make any money for this. She mm -hmm. doesn't, this is just a, a life mission and life yeah. calling for her. Yeah. But what's interesting about it is that the way they accomplished this long period of colonization was by creating this caste system and also at the same time canceling all their history. Mm. So they made them believe that to be Christian, you needed to give up all of this sort of like weird, satanic, demonic mm. worship that mm. they were like treating like voodoo, mm. right? But, Which was really about Egyptian mystery school stuff because it was all yeah. about Osiris. They have this Obatala is the name of their Osiris, mm -hmm. right? Obatala. Yeah. And, and they canceled it all. So this is why she didn't even know because her father was ashamed of right. being from the tribe, because being from the tribe meant you couldn't be an evolved man. Right. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. This is exactly what's happening in society right it's now. It's brilliant, but evil. It's, it's, it's diabolical and dystopian. Yeah. And it's despotic. And thankfully, mm -hmm. you know, the rest of the European theater kind of got their arms around this and was able to wrestle out right. Congo. And, right. you know, eventually it, it ended up becoming emancipated. But... But it's, it's like, still. It's, it's, what is it now, though? It's, it's, you know, these, these, all right, so I, I am my own person, and I, I, I very seldomly associate with groups, right? Because I do believe that people are just people. And when I say groups, let's talk about the African diaspora. diaspora. Let's talk about the transatlantic slave trade. All right, now there's many, um, I, I did my genealogy on one side of my family, on my mother's side. I thought that I was just pretty certain that there would be slavery at the end of that road, and it wasn't, right? Even though they're from the United States. My father's side, they're, from, they're not from this country, so it's hard to trace. Now, you know, I've studied this extensively, and there's a lot of people that look like myself that was already here, right, pre-Columbus. So, and a lot of people that we call natives just look like me, right? So what we seen, the marketing was a mulatto, called a mulatto Indian, right? So, but you don't realize that a lot of people that were here already were not slaves, right? And there was a lot of white people that were slaves. Chinese people were slaves. And they tried to enslave a lot of indigenous as well. Oh, yeah. It's a very, it's a, I mean, it's a very dynamic story. A lot story. of people don't know that 
<laughs> like indentured servitude mm -hmm. was the way that a lot of people got across the plains to come out to California, right. Oregon, and Washington. Yeah, yeah. So there's a lot that is not taught. You have to go and seek out this information. But um, you know, but the people that were brought here, they were not. They weren't the people that brought them were not stupid. They wasn't bringing tribesmen together. They was mixing people up. So you have a plantation of workers. They all look alike, but they don't relate. They don't right. speak the same language. They had different customs, et cetera. But they would, there would be certain people who would learn various langu languages and knew different tribal languages that would gather people up. And voodoo, voodoo was, uh, it was, is not evil. Like I know that it's marketed as something dark and demonic, but it was very light and they would, it was African customs and religions that they would, they would uh, season it with Catholicism mm -hmm. to make the plantation managers think that, yo, this is Catholic, we're Catholics. Right? Yeah, I mean, that's what happened in Congo too. They had to become Christian. Yeah, right. but a lot of them just hid their religion under mm -hmm. it, you know. But Congo, Haiti, it's as bad as it gets. And these are stories that we don't ever learn about. We learn about the transatlantic slave trade, but. Yeah, Leopold massacred 12 million. More than that, so many. At least, right? That's... And then the people whose hands were cut off, right? It was, it was, nobody knows who Leopold is. You know, it was just interesting. I don't want to harp on negative, right? Because I do feel, well, I, I see that the peop, the melanated people like myself that's here, it's an interesting combination, you know, of powerful people. And I say that because you think of like s the story of Cinderella, she was treated like shit, but look, she became mm -hmm. Cinderella. And I see a lot of that here. When I look at black people in different parts of the world, um, no one's producing things like we're producing here, you know? And we're the babies cut from the umbilical cord. Everybody else have been there forever, right? But we're able to really, you know, export culture to the world. One of the things know? I love the most, I have a lot of black friends. Mm -hmm. I always have had. Right. And um, the common denominator I see, the ones that I become friends with, mm -hmm. that somehow, because you know, the, the type of frequency you carry is mm -hmm. what you attract. Correct. Right. So that's why I ended up meeting you. Right. Because it's a like frequency. Right. right? And that's why you, you reached out to me. It's, it's an unsaid and unknown and unseen mm -hmm. thing that attracts people to people in their lives. Right. right? It's like Queen Diambi, who I greatly respect. Um, Billy Carson, right, who that's, does that's Ancient fun. Aliens. He's, he's like one of my that. best yeah. friends. Mm -hmm. You know, this guy was the only guy that literally called me every day, texted me every day when I had COVID. Really? Wow. Every day. The only person. So I'm not do, yeah. Yeah, just to check in on me. Mm -hmm. Like I like he's a genuine like a genuine person. Right. Like a truly genuine person. And right. I love him to death and he's got an incredible amount of knowledge. Yeah. Um Major, another one of my really good friends. He did his podcast which, you know, ended up in the music category, you mm -hmm. know, on the cover of Ad Week it was like number 1 or whatever and wow. on Amazon. And you know, love that guy. He's like mm -hmm. a brother to me. We mm -hmm. met again like energy right attracts like energy i would like to tell a story of how i uh -huh, met sure. you to the people people will believe it or not it's okay but i'm not a person that like a lot of people they see me you know social media and they i don't know some people spirituality is like a cool thing to them mm -hmm. right to me it's just normal right just like miracles are normal right it's the process of things but I don't subscribe to anything that I can't really understand, grasp scientifically. So I always tell people I don't believe anything. I either know or I don't know. It's that simple. So one thing that really attracted me to to you was the fact that, you know, shout out to Maya. Um, she told me about you and I followed you, but hadn't had an opportunity like a year ago. Mm -hmm. I, hadn't, I hadn't, hadn't had an opportunity to look into your content yet. And but I would see your posts. I'm like, that looks kind of cool. You mm -hmm. know, it was always there. And one night I go home and I pa I'm watching videos. I have a hard time watching fiction unless it's a really good movie mm -hmm. or something classic. I just try to learn. So I lay down and I pass right out. I had a weird dream. My dreams are usually normal, like circumstances and, you know, 
people I know, whatever. But this dream was images. It was these these colorful balls, black background, yeah, that's <laughs> right? And they were moving. It was just an interesting uh, uh, image that I had in my head in my dream. I wake up and you're on the constant of one, or one is the only constant, mm-hmm. right? And I'm like, wow, this is. I've been meaning to check check him out. Man, this is heavy. Wow, he's smart. Wow, he's he's smart in a very practical way. It's not like magical woo woo stuff, right? Because I'm not that guy, right? I'm in this material world and I'm mm-hmm. all in. But I I do you know try to ascend in consciousness, and I think mm-hmm. it's all together. It shouldn't be it separate. Is. So as I'm watching, I see those images that I saw in my dream on the screen. I'm like, get the fuck out of here. What? What? I'm just sitting, I set up, I sat up on my bed, like looking around, like, what? Like, who can I tell? Like, no one, no one can see what I saw in my brain and you know, mm-hmm. thinking all these things, but it was just fascinating. So all night I'm listening to you, I'm pausing it, I'm looking up stuff that you said. Cause I do that for everything, just to understand. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, this guy is so on point. And then, you know, going to your LinkedIn and seeing your 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 education and your business acumen and the things that you've accomplished and are accomplishing with such a ripe mind, you know, mm-hmm. and to be thank such you. a good human being, I'm like, this is the guy, you know. So <laughs> thank you. I, that's 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 why I messaged I, I, you. I'm very grateful to have met you, and we yeah. we hit it off right away. Right. And I knew when you reached out to me. That's why I do actually read my DMs. I can't right. get to every one of them. Right. But I I. I go to the ones that I'm energetically attracted to. Right, right. right? And certainly, uh, the point I was going to make about these other guys, which is amazing, Delphine Diallo is another one. She's a, these are powerhouses. Right. These people are master manifestors. Mm -hmm. They reject any notion of victimhood. I mean, freaking Billy Carson built an entire city underground. An entire city underground. To withstand like a nuclear blast, who wow. does that? Wow! Right, and I'm like, dude, I want to buy the next one you do. I'll be buy one of the. I want <laughs> right. to buy one of those houses underground. Right. I don't know how I'm going to get my ass out to Dort, Georgia, where right. it is. But yeah. and it's it's amazing what he's done. Right. And you know, I, I think about and every one of these people are completely happy right. in who they are, and then they just have more and more abundance thrown on them right. because they keep feeling more abundant. Mm-hmm. And it really is not as complicated not, as we think. It's not. Listen, I, I'm very glad that I met you as well. And I'm very fortunate. Like, the, the people that I know, it's really cool, right? When I, if I sat down and, and told stories of everyone that I know, you know, it's like a movie. But, however, I do feel that we're all coming together. For a reason. For a reason. We haven't got to that point yet, and it's fine, right? But it's it's something energetically that is happening. There is a, a an ascension of conscious of a collective consciousness that is rising. Oh, it's on. It, it's happening. <laughs> it's, it's definitely happening on. And it's so strong. I'm like, it's so strong. It's so strong, and you know, everything that I do in my life is not for me. It's for people that I love that I care about. So that's why I go so hard for everything and for everybody. And I don't sleep much, right? I know I need to fix that, but I'm just so fascinated by learning and life and getting out and doing things. And I want to ask you this. Sure. What is it that, what excites you? What excites you the most? Meetings like this Mm -hmm. excite me. Mm -hmm. Um, Being able to, so when you really believe that the world around you is just the you inverse, Mm-hmm. Right, so when I say what's inside you, mm-hmm. you could take that as a math equation. Let's say you have a number mm-hmm. of expression, and yours is whatever number it is. If I take one over that number, mm-hmm. right? So one, and then a line, and then over that mm-hmm. number, that will give you a period of repetition, a repetition okay. cycle. So right. it gives you a gigantic long number, depending on how long your number is. Mm-hmm. That would be repetition, like one over seven, for example. Mm-hmm. If seven were your number, that's my number. It's Seven. crazy you said that. Okay, there you go. I promise you, it's my number. So that means that your repetition cycle is going to be 0.142857. And those six numbers repeat over and over and over again infinitely. 0.142857. And then 142857, 142857, 142857. Now, let's imagine now that you go through life and you, you, know, you keep having these fractals 
smaller representations or experiences mm -hmm. that are kind of part of a larger trend. I'm sure if you tried to tell the story of your life, you probably have an arc to that story. And one day, I'm sure you'll probably write a book about it, right? And that book is probably going to tell your story of how you found who you are, because that's the greatest journey of all. Mm -hmm. The greatest journey of all is unlocking the encryptions that you left for yourself in your higher mind, mm -hmm. in your higher consciousness. And then being able to realize those things to realize your life mission and why you're here. Why did you choose the path you chose? Now, Steve Jobs gave a great speech. Uh, I think it was 2005 at Stanford University for graduation. And this mm -hmm. year, I'm speaking at ASU at the graduation, wow. which I'm really excited about. Nice. Right, for their I went there. Business school. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, great. Yeah. So the thing I loved about his speech is he talks about all these things that he did in his life that had no apparent connection to each other. Yeah. Like one of the things, he dropped out of school and he went to typesetting school instead. Mm. He wanted to learn typesetting. Well, why was typesetting important? He never understood why typesetting was so important. This is like the old kind of like, you know, printing press model right. of typesetting. Right. But in the 1980s, I was around back then, we had these bitmap printers that made these ridiculous looking printouts from computers, right? Mm -hmm. I could do my report in my class on my computer, mm -hmm. but it would print out in this terrible format. Mm -hmm. And it was Steve Jobs who said, you know what? Let's apply typesetting principles to this and start making serifs, right? Mm -hmm. The little things on the letters that mm -hmm. make them pretty, right? Mm -hmm. And let's put that in a laser printer. And so then the whole industry shifted towards that model and paradigm. Mm -hmm. And you would never know that if it weren't for him dropping out of school at Reed College and then going on to typesetting school, mm -hmm. that we might not have gotten that far along at the point in time that we did. Right. You just don't know how all the dots in your life connect until mm -hmm. you can see them in the retrospect. This is the, right. this is the value of wisdom. You know, I used to think when I was young, I say this all the time, my, my parents when I was 15 were pretty idiot. They were pretty dumb. Mm -hmm. I was like, my parents must be the dumbest people on the earth, right? Like, they, they don't let me do this. They don't let me do that. Right, right. Why do they have all these stupid rules? You know, I don't agree with them. They see things in a monopolar way. It's just wrong. Mm. As every year that passed after that, till I was about 25, they gained, like, you know, at least 10 IQ points in my mind. Right. It wasn't that they really got smarter. It mm. was that my perception of reality was, was changing mm. and evolving. Right. I, at 20 years old, I thought everything was black and white. Right. I thought I could separate the world into this and into that. Mm -hmm. But now I realize that what I thought was fact might actually only be a facet. Mm -hmm. And that one little letter E mm -hmm. made all the difference. Right. When you realize that what I thought was fact is actually just one facet of a larger prism of a whole truth, mm -hmm. and that the sum of all possible perspectives of that truth is what I need to seek to understand. Mm -hmm. Therefore, the way I'm seeing it is only a narrow perspective. Mm -hmm. How do I expand my perspective? And being able to expand that perspective to feel the empathy for what it's like, mm -hmm. right? That's why I, I like to go around the world. That's why I like to have friends of very diverse backgrounds. That's mm -hmm. why I like to hear their stories. I like to learn about them because in them, I can learn a whole nother perspective and another facet of life. Mm -hmm. To me, that's a, it's such a powerful thing because then I'm no longer right all the time. Right. I'm, I'm just like one facet of a larger right. truth. And, right. and it should be combined to understand it from a bigger perspective. Right. So this is why I don't see, you know, we could say, oh, yeah, there, are there evil people in the world? Yes, there are evil people in the world. Mm -hmm. But my point that I'm trying to make to you is that at a base material level, or the prima materia, as it's said mm -hmm. in sort of like the alchemical world and circle, uh, none of us starts off any better or any worse than anyone else. I, I, I wholeheartedly agree with that. So my concept on good and evil is, is this. There is no one that is inherently good or evil, right? Yep. It's just circumstances pushes them in whichever direction. Because yep. I know people, and I, I used to be a very like, reactionary person i have a lot of energy in me and you know when i was young it was however it came out is how it came out right i had power but no refinement and it took it took a learning and life experiences to refine it and understand the power and control and restraint and not doing so i learned that and i adopted that 
But one thing that I did notice is that there were people who I had some kind of dealing with or they had dealing with people that I care about and they were wrong. When people were automatically, yep, they're bad, write them off. I would find a way to like guide them into or push them into a positive space because we're all malleable, right? And you never know. That's why I don't judge like that. Like the question I asked my buddy about the $50 billion. I'm not going to say what I would do. I don't know what I would do. I know what I, I like to consider myself a man of character, but that's, that's some other shit. <laughs> you know, I don't know what that feels. <laughs> I don't know what that feels like. And I'm just being honest. That's one thing about me is I'll be honest about it. So good, bad, it's where you're at. It's where the person is at. I do think that it's best for us to know, especially when we're powerful, let's stay in spaces that keep us in light, keep us in a positive uh, uh, space. And that's what I do consciously, like like all the time. I try to stay, you know, I, I, I don't consume certain types of content. I don't want it sitting on me, right? Um, and I just try to keep myself in a very positive mindset. Yeah, you don't want to be stuck in a... It's like I have these singing bowls, right? Mm. And if I if I do the singing bowl, mm -hmm. it's made of crystal, um, and I do it in the room next to my room with a piano in it, mm -hmm. I can hear the piano string ringing on mm -hmm. the same frequency. Wow, yeah. So the same note will yeah. play on the piano, mm -hmm. right? Because it's called sympathetic resonance. Mm -hmm. or if I take the bowl, if I have, I have these metal bowls also that are Tibetan right. singing bowls, and I... Do the you know the little mallet around it that you could basically use. It's kind of like when you put your finger on top of a wet right. wine glass mm -hmm. and you can make that sound. Same type of thing. It happens to resonate at exactly the same frequency mm -hmm. as my fire alarm system in my office. Wow. So it makes the fire alarm system start ringing. Wow. Not like loud. Yeah. It'll just go nee, wow. like this. And so it's exactly the same for us when we take in positive mm -hmm. or negative external content. Right. Whatever that content is. Right. So if you want to keep society low, narrow their perspective. That's keep the them in echo chambers of their own conditioning biases mm -hmm. so that they cannot open up so that, you know, friendships like ours wouldn't happen. Right. Because it's this is power. Right. This is empowerment. That's why I think free speech is so critically important because... Mm -hmm. I don't want to be stuck to somebody's narrative. Mm -hmm. And yeah, does that mean that sometimes I have to tolerate some pretty shitty things to be said? Yes. But I realize that it's a critical aspect and mm -hmm. I have to take some of that bad mm -hmm. to get the good, right? which is the conscious expansion. Mm -hmm. And let's understand why this person thinks like that. Let's talk about it. Yeah. Let's, you know, it's... I've had many times that I'm promoting a product or a service or what have you and people... We'll just complain about the price or whatever. And I'm like, this is perfect. That way I do another piece of content explaining why. Just promoting my, marketing my stuff more. But I flip them all the time. So I'm good with, I, I always stand on what I believe is, is truth, is mm -hmm. the best whatever it is. So I, I'm fearless when it comes to like facing the world. Uh, I carry the flag for whatever I represent. And I'll take on all adversary because I know I can flip them. Now, speaking of adversary and negative content and this, that, and the third, I came to a realization not long ago, right? Now, when I grew up, you know, grew up in religion, I believed everything, I was afraid of everything, it was terrifying. As a kid, I'm like, man, like, all roads lead to hell. Like, it's, <laughs> hard, it's so hard not to go to hell, right? But then as I got, when I went to, when I went to school, um, I took world religions class and I was like, what? This makes sense. It's, people came up with this stuff. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I was learning the actual history of this religion and that religion. This religion used to be this and this and the third. So you learn about things not being literal, maybe. Mm -hmm. So then I was like, oh, fuck religion. <laughs> then as I got older, I'm like, nah, religion is, people need religion, you know? Yeah. People need, like me being in so, like an uh, uh, influencer on social media, it's like a little microcosm of the world. Like I'm the president of the world, of my world. And you know, people really do need guidance, you know? So I I think, I respect religion, I get it. Um, it's just how people operate them is kind of suspect, but the concept of religion, I think is generally good. Now, symbolism. I've always been, I've read the Bible, I've read the Quran, I've never read the Torah though. 
I've read Tao Te Ching. I've read a lot of books, right? The Bible was always interesting in me because the stories were so fascinating, like movies. Yeah. It like took my mind to another place. Mm -hmm. And, you know, as I, so I stopped looking at everything as that's impossible. This is not literal. They're wrong. But I stopped doing that because I don't know anything. I'm a baby. So I just start every now and then I go back and reread certain books in the Bible. And I'm like, mm, this is interesting. So, you know, my name is Mike. It was Michael, right? When I went to Catholic school when I was young, and there was an, a statue in the church that bothered me. It's like, why is this here? This is scary. And it was uh, an angel stabbing with a spear, stabbing a demon. I'm mm. like, we're kids. Like, why do we have to see this? You know what I mean? So that, you know what that probably was. That was Michael. That was the archangel, archangel Michael. Mm -hmm. Right? So I remember Michael from the Bible, but not his name right because the first time i read it you know it was a while ago but i remember this dude this angel would throw people to hell right mm -hmm. and he would also carry good people to heaven but he was satan's biggest adversary like he, he's the one who expels satan from heaven right and it was just him antagonizing satan fighting satan right so with my friends with people i love and care about i'm always the person that like i like to jump in front of the bullet Mm -hmm. You know, figuratively speaking, I don't want to really jump in front of a bullet, but I literally would for people I love, to be honest. And everybody knows that. And I have no fear for anything like that. So war is kind of like a comfort for me, right? I'm very versed in it. History of war, literal war, you know, uh, spiritual war, jihad, uh, the war within your higher and lower self war with any, all of it I love it I don't have a problem with it I don't go out there promoting it you know but I'm okay with it right and it, and, and I start believing like maybe I'm like maybe some of my DNA some of my information is Archangel Michael why is my name Michael why do I have angel wings tatted all over my body hey, I'll say this names matter names matter I was called angel as a kid because I look so sweet and innocent little angel angel it's tatted all over my body, angels. Never knew why. Like I had, in my office in Miami, in my old gym, I had a, a big ultra realistic mural painted of an angel, of a statue of an angel. I've always been drawn to angels. My, we have a, a nonprofit where we go feed people and stuff like that in all these cities called Dirty Angels, you know? Cause we go get dirty, but doing angelic work, right? And I like to, I don't donate money. I go, I go out there and get dirty. Because I don't fear anything out there. You know what I mean? So it's interesting. I feel like that might be in my DNA and my coding somehow. Because some people, just like my mother as a nurse, when I was a kid, I used to be like, how could she touch these people? Like quadriplegic, paraplegic, taking care of old people. But I was like, yo, she's so perfect. Like, because I could not do that, right? Some people are just assigned to do certain things, yeah. you know? And I think that my spiritual assignment is that of an archangel mm -hmm. like Michael you know what here's the beauty of the way the world works too the things and the images that we take in once we start realizing that it's a you inverse around us mm -hmm. the things that we start seeing the people that we start meeting mm -hmm. are signatures of the resonance that you're carrying mm -hmm. right so for example, the other morning I was uh, I was at uh, Moulin, this French restaurant, and there's this uh, this guy carrying around a hawk on his arm. Mm -hmm. uh, they keep the hawk so that the hawk will just fly above this like strip mall area, right. and all the rats and stuff will see it and run. It's right. like they all know. It's like right. get out of town, yeah. right? Because the hawk is a badass, right? Right. And and so they're just afraid of it. They just leave. Mm -hmm. So that's how they that's how they have pest control, mm -hmm. right? It's really hard to get rid of rats. I mean, it's really right. hard to get yeah. rid of rats. And I remember the guy came over to me and the hawk was staring at me. I was staring at the hawk. The hawk was staring at me. I was staring at the hawk. And I felt like I was taking in some totem mm. of experience. Mm. And that this, there's a reason when we see symbols that show up in our lives, they could be numbers, could be 
angel numbers, mm -hmm. 111, 222, 333. And you start seeing, you wake up in the middle of the night to go to the bathroom and it's like 111. Like what the, mm -hmm. how is it always the same number? Mm -hmm. For me, it was 432, mm -hmm. 137. Uh, these numbers 432 has up. popped up a few times since yeah. we sat in here. Keep showing up, mm -hmm. right? And that synchronicity is a sign. And when you register synchronicities, that's what Carl Jung basically says, mm -hmm. is the surest sign of conscious expansion. The more synchronicities you register, whether they be spirit animals or whatever, mm -hmm. as I just gave an example, mm -hmm. or numerical, or some other omen type of a thing. Now, I remember one day, I uh, this is 2019. It was on my 50th, my 50th birthday, mm -hmm. and there was a, a a bird. I was just in my office in my house, and we were getting ready for this big party we we're going to have that night, mm -hmm. the concert and everything in my backyard. Right. And this bird flew into my window of my office, bounced off it, and dead. Wow. Immediately dead. Right. It was like one of those morning doves. Wow. Right? So I go outside, and I'm like, I took a picture of it. I was like, that was weird. Right. But if I hadn't seen that bird, mm -hmm. I wouldn't have walked outside and seen a gigantic halo around the sun. Mm. Right? And I videoed it. I posted it on social media. It was this incredibly beautiful, like, rainbow halo around the sun. Mm -hmm. And I remember when I saw that, I felt this incredibly powerful, like some would refer to it as samadhi experience. Now, I don't consider myself religious. Mm -hmm. I am spiritual. Mm -hmm. now, what is the difference between religion and spirituality? I believe that you know, both will be as you perceive it mm -hmm. to you. That's the way it works. Right. right. So the person who is skeptical on religion is going to think religion is bad. And the person who is skeptical on spirituality is going to think spirituality is bad. Mm -hmm. And the big difference that I've seen with religion is that it's, it requires an organization. It requires, you know, there's sort of like a, types of rituals, et cetera, that they have to do. Mm -hmm. uh, the storytelling aspect of it, which I think is actually a really good aspect of mm -hmm. it in many ways. Uh, the stories are great too. And then it includes kind of like, you know, obedience rules mm -hmm. generally. Mm -hmm. Not all religions, but, you know, as if you sort of think about the archetype of religion, you would think of that, yeah. right? So I'm, like, here's yeah. a right and here's wrong. Obedience so, authority models. Right, it's sort of an obedience authority yeah. model, right? And there's an organization and it requires some membership mm -hmm. sort of requirements and stipulations. Mm -hmm. Spirituality doesn't require any organization. Mm -hmm. It requires no money. It requires nothing more than you going within yourself and being willing to look at yourself and figure out the narratives that you've been telling yourself that are limited in scope, they're not necessarily wrong. Mm -hmm. They're just one right. facet. Right. And you know, the difference between facet and fact is only that letter E. And I always think of that from a mathematical perspective because I love math. And E is a mathematical constant called the Euler number. Mm. And it's just like pi. So it, it's, it makes squares instead of making circles. You could think of it like that. Mm -hmm. So, but for every circle, there must be a square also, mm -hmm. right? For every feminine, there must be a masculine, right? Right. Mm -hmm. So when you think of these terms, okay, so I got E and Euler is two point seven one eight, pi is three point one four. We mm -hmm. learned that in school. My birthday. Yeah, the mm -hmm. two work together to make a triangle. So if I have a triangle with pi as its sides, the height is going to be approximately the Euler number, mm -hmm. the height of the triangle, the mm -hmm. unseen part, mm -hmm. right? So if I cut that triangle in half, right. it's an equilateral triangle. But Euler is unique because 271. Okay, 271. Well, the word Euler is named after a Swiss mathematician named Leonard Euler. Euler actually means it's spelled E-U-L-E-R, but pronounced Euler, like oil. Mm -hmm. Oil in German, Euler, means owl. Mm. Means owl. Mm. How far does an owl's head rotate around on its neck? It has a unique characteristic, right? Mm -hmm. It can spin its head just over 270 degrees. Mm. So almost 272 degrees, in fact. Mm -hmm. 272 is the Euler number. Wow. Now, you could say, that's just all pure coincidence, Robert. Well, by the way, why did they even name it after Leonard Euler in the first place? Because mm -hmm. he wasn't the one who discovered the Euler number. The Euler number was discovered, if you look at the history books, and probably it was predating much then because we mm -hmm. know da Vinci had it too, but it was, it was um, Isaac Newton mm -hmm. who first wrote about the Euler number. Mm -hmm. It controls, it's a speed limit of 
the speed limit of the universe. If the universe has a speed limit that's light speed, mm -hmm. the speed limit of light speed will be the Euler number because mm -hmm. it controls all wave expansion mm -hmm. as well. So the reason I bring this up to you is that all the things that we experience that we think are just happenstance around us are not. Yeah. Every single moment you have is an opportunity to experience divine connection to the universe. How does one do that? How does one step into these moments and experience divinity? True self-acceptance. True self-love. So I don't mean narcissistic self-love. I not mean the selfies and all no, that. No, you said true. So it's true, true self-love. That means mm -hmm. loving the whole self. Yeah. See, the things that we judge in other people negatively mm -hmm. are the things that we ourselves crave. Mm -hmm. I'll say that again. The things that we judge in other people that they're doing that bother us, that trigger us, are the things that we ourselves crave and we are not consciously aware of. Mm. So we become what we judge. We don't judge the world as it is, we judge it as we are. This is the lens that you were referencing. Mm -hmm. We attract, therefore, everything we judge until we no longer judge everything we attracted. Mm -hmm. So if you say, I don't like somebody, you know, you got somebody who's very woke, right? It's like, oh, I'm judgmental on this because I, I don't like what they did this, I don't like what they did that, right? And, and it's, you know, whatever it is, you could take any number of topics and virtue signaling attached to it, right? Mm -hmm. The thing that they're judging is usually the thing that they are, mm -hmm. that they're not even aware of. Now, can you think of examples like that? Oh, I can think of many. In fact, my whole life, I've seen that. You know, is it possible for someone, like whenever someone calls out the ego being large in another person, have you ever noticed that the person calling out the ego being large in someone else is usually kind of pretty egoic? Yep. Yep. And the people that doesn't even notice, the person that doesn't even notice another person's ego is like the most humble person in the world. Yeah. Isn't that interesting? It is. It's like people that call themselves Antifa. Mm. You know, I, I'm an anti-fascist. So wait, I'm going to define myself by, by what I'm not. All right. What's interesting about it is that Antifa starts to smell and look like... Fascism. Fascism. Yeah. Because it's all about control. And if I look at Kim Jong-un or Kim Jong-il or any number of Hitlers or whatever, they all ran on social democracies that eventually, Castro included, that eventually became despotic authoritarian mm -hmm. tyrants that are autocratic and fascist. Mm -hmm. So in fact, I can never even think of a single example of a communist regime that ever turned into anything other than a fascist regime. So this is the perfect example in my mind of we are what we judge. The thing we judge, and so there's a great, great quote by a guy by the name of Saul Alinsky. And he said, our world is not a world of angels. Rather, it is a world of angles. A world where men speak of moral principle, yet act on power principle. Mm -hmm. A world where we are always moral and our enemies are always immoral. Mm -hmm. It's the oldest story in the book. You've got a shepherd somewhere in the Middle East who looks over and says, you know, the sun's been really rough on my side of the, of the hillside here. And that's one that's in the shade. It's got all the green grass. I'm gonna let y'all in on a little secret on what I'm sipping on. It's called mental jewels. See that? What is mental jewels, you might ask? It's a nootropic or a smart drug. It's all natural with clinically proven ingredients that aid in improving memory, improving focus, boosting mental clarity, elevating your mood, and managing stress. There's a few big selling nootropics on the market and I can objectively say that Mental Jewels is the best. We took what was out there and we made sure that ours had better ingredients, better formulation, and we got third-party testing done so that y'all can all have confidence in what you get from us meets the label claims. Listen, I always give reference to King Solomon. When all the other kings asked God for money, military power, women, he didn't, he asked for wisdom. And with him getting what he asked for, he was able to be the wealthiest and most powerful and had an abundance of women. When you can think clear, sharp, and creatively, you have an advantage. When you can stay focused on a project and see it through, you have an advantage. Most people have the attention span of a fruit fly. 
We live in an information age where short clips, bright lights, quick edits reign supreme and have molded people's brain in a way that retention, processing information has become an antiquated skill set. I don't know about you, but my brain is my best asset. So I do everything I can to keep it right, powerful, and healthy. And uh, it's got all the green grass. You know, that guy that owns that land over there, he worships a different God than me. Mm. My God came to me in a dream last night, told me, I should take that land and consecrate it to my God. Mm. And then it'll be righteous land. Sound familiar? Yeah. We do not what is right. We do what is right for us. At the time, right. And whatever is... We don't even realize that we is justify that, whatever right? we do. Is that right? No, no. It's just we're not consciously aware of it. And what we need to learn is how to see this in ourselves. Okay. That's the most important. You want to feel that divine connection? Start realizing that you're only the way you've been seeing the world is not the only right way to see the world. Okay. It's just the way you've seen the world. And, and, you, and it doesn't mean that you're going to hate yourself for having right. seen it only that way or for right. the bad things you've necessarily done for it because mm -hmm. there's no value in worry or regret. Right. I don't believe in worry or regret. Those are wasted mm -hmm. feelings. And, and right. guilt as well because what can you do about it? Past is past. Right. Move on. You have to look forward and find the silver lining in everything that happens in your life, even the things you screwed up on your own. Right. But once you start to realize that you've been giving yourself a self-narrative of bullshit, that's the first doorway to start really expanding your conscious awareness, to start getting in the shoes of other people and feel what their heart feels. And I use the term heart on purpose mm -hmm. because we are such a left brain society. We don't, as soon as, you know, as soon as I would meet someone and I would get to know their family or their personal circumstance or how they grew up, the fastest way to get people to become friends is for them just to tell their story mm -hmm. and, and have other people listen to that story. You know, I had a chance once to uh, go to Israel and, uh, in 2007, and we decided as a group, it was this group I'm in called YPO, and we decided we wanted to host a dinner with the leaders of business in Israel with the leaders of business, all members of YPO as well, as a global organization, of the Palestinian chapter. Mm -hmm. Because we figured, hey, if we can get these people to start doing business together, you know, that's actually one of the very best proven ways to avoid conflict, mm -hmm. right? And it was one of the coolest things to have the Palestinian business leaders sit down with the Israeli business leaders and become friends. Mm -hmm. Because they started realizing, hey, we're not so dissimilar after all. Right. You know, maybe we can do a few things together. Mm -hmm. It's really just about getting into the heart of somebody else, right. feeling what they feel, trying to see the world through their eyes. Right. And that becomes the true eye of Horus. Mm -hmm. When you can start to expand your own perception by seeing the way that other people will see it, then you access a whole other aspect of yourself. And that access is like the samadhi experience that I was just talking about. That's interesting. I, you know, I'm a baby because I, I have so much learning and growing to do, right? Despite the growth and learnt that I've experienced thus far, but I'm a baby and I'll tell you why. I'm asking you certain questions and you're answering them the right way, what I know to be right. And what I know to be right is not the uh the when i asked you is that right we were talking about um people seeing things what's right for themselves yeah. i said well is that right because the more primitive nature of me side of me i think there's beauty in being primitive too yeah but that that part says that's right what's good for you is good right and you you're too kind for that and I love that. I'm, it makes me think of um, a, a, few, a bunch of us went to Haiti uh, a couple years ago, and one of my buddies, Jerry, shout out to Jerry. He's you'll meet him. Yeah. He, he actually has a business uh, in your field, in one of your fields, uh, the dental billing. Oh, and uh, and patient yeah. financing, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Jerry's a good, just a good human being. So he's from Haiti. He's American, but from born in Haiti, 
And, you know, we had our own island and it was fun, but we also hung out in the city and it's rough, right? And yeah, people have, people have nothing, place. you know, mm -hmm. but they seem fine. So we were at one stop and people are coming up trying to, it's funny, no one's asking for money. They're trying to help you to get money. They're trying to offer a service or something. Mm -hmm. And he, he took off his shoes and gave them to a guy. And the guy was just like, the look that the guy gave him was like, like, thank you. Like, I don't, I can go home now. You know what I mean? Because it's a hustle. When you they see tourists, they like trying to get oh, what yeah. they can get. Mm -hmm. But he gave him his shoes and that guy was so content and so, like they so spoke to each other, like hugged, you know what I mean? And I'm not that kind of kind yet, but I, I want to get there in a real way, you know? When I really just like, here. Because I'm like that with people I know. Mm -hmm. But not with people I don't know, you know? I'm what kinda, if all the people you meet mm -hmm. are just a different reflection of you? So that's when you ask me what gets me excited. Mm -hmm. This type of thing gets me excited now. Mm -hmm. You know, I am in a different place now in my life because I've had a great career. Mm -hmm. you know, I've done all kinds of stuff. I look back at my path now. I'm like, wow, I can't believe I did all that stuff. It's kind of cool and all. But now I realize that if, if I really believe in this concept of you inverse, then the way that I will continue to learn and grow is seeing other people likewise learn and grow. Mm -hmm. And I don't expect and I don't need anything in return for it. Mm -hmm. You know, people often will be like, oh, dude, why do you charge for your book? Well, wait, why do you think that someone should go and make a book and just give it out for free, right? Mm -hmm to everybody and when it costs something to make it, right? And mm -hmm. so that's an entitlement thing. So it's not gonna resonate with every single person, right. right? But I, you know, I do these podcasts all the time. I do all the content I post on social media. Um, you know, all of that's free. And mm -hmm. there's nothing in it that's not in my book or that's vice versa. Nothing mm -hmm. in my book that's not there, mm -hmm. right? It just organizes it. So it makes it easier for right. someone to be able to synthesize mm -hmm. versus like looking at all these posts every day right. for like years. Mm -hmm. But I'm doing, you know, I, I, I really believe that by raising, helping people to see the power within, mm -hmm. their own power, realize who they are, remember who they are. That's why I did a TV show called Code X. You're the X. Mm -hmm. You're the encryption. It's up to each of us to find what we left as a message to ourselves and why we wanted to learn it through all the myriad experiences that we have in our lifetimes. Mm -hmm. And that's like the most beautiful thing ever. So that makes me super content. It makes me super jazzed. It makes me super excited about life. Because as I live more and more down this path, the people that come in my path are beautiful. The people I, that come in my path, and they're beautiful all, for all kinds of different reasons. Not because they're good looking. Not because, although you're pretty good looking. <laughs> um, it's not because of what we'd see at the outward appearances. They have mm. beautiful things to convey. Right. And, you know, it was uh, Helen Keller, who was a quadriplegic. Mm -hmm. She was deaf and blind. Mm -hmm. And yet she had I didn't know foresight. she was quadriplegic. I just, yeah. I know about the deaf yeah. and blindness. Yeah. Oh, wow. Amazing, right? That's wow. Totally amazing. Yeah. She's impacted millions of people's lives. Mm -hmm. And yet she said the only thing worse, of all the senses to lose, I think blindness would be the toughest, right? Mm -hmm. In my mind, right? Because yeah. it's like... You, uh, there's a lot of things that you need to be able to see, right? right? You'd want to be able to see. Yeah. And she said the only thing worse than blindness is to have sight without vision. Mm. And it's a powerful quote because how many of us complain about what we see mm -hmm. and yet we can see? I mean, just saying complain about what we see, you got to stop right there, you know? Right, so this place, I believe, and you gave this analogy, I thought it was beautiful, about heaven and hell. Mm -hmm. I believe this place, you know, a lot of people think this is like a giant escape room game. Right? How do I get off planet Earth? Mm -hmm. Right, a lot of these people, a lot of star seeds will be like, oh yeah, I gotta go back to my star system, wherever I'm from originally. Right. They'll say this type of stuff. And if you do believe that, that this earth is some sort of like testing ground or learning ground or universe as a whole is a testing or learning ground, then maybe you can grasp this concept also, which is what if the game was not to learn how to escape from earth, 
right? Just to escape from Earth. Mm-hmm. What if the game was to fall in love with it? What if the game was to learn to accept it? And the more we accepted and fell in love with it, as well as ourselves, the more we would embody being the change we wanted to see in the world. Mm-hmm. What if that's really the purpose of the game? Because a lot of people think, I gotta escape this escape room. What if the only way you transcend it is by falling in love with it? Right. And that's the philosophy I try to take to every single day. How can I fall in love with this place more? How can I fall in love with the people that I meet? How can I fall in love with the individual experiences? How can I fall in love with the learnings? How can I fall in love with the vulnerabilities and mistakes that I make, the vulnerabilities that I possess? Because in so doing, I will learn how to accept and love everyone around me even more. Mm -hmm. To me, that's really the reason to be here. I don't think we're here in this escape room called Earth to learn more judgment. Mm -hmm. I think we're here to learn to transcend judgment. Mm -hmm. I think we're here, I believe and feel that we're here to learn to love and how to be loved. I I think I agree with you. When um when asked what is life about to me, purpose of life, I've had many different reasons, but I chose to assign purpose in my life and my life for me is to be happy. Just so being that me being happy is me making other people happy. Yeah. And being a service to other people. That really makes me feel valued and feel important and feel loved and happy. So that's personally mine, right? Um, I can't not think about the fact that to some extent, sometimes I think we're just an accident, right? We stumble upon fire or how to harness that fire, (laughs) put the fire to the meat, brains got big, you know? And because, and I say that because of this, look at all of the things that we've created, right? It's from our minds, right? Our imagination. But no animal that we know of can do anything even close to this. They don't get it. A lion don't kill five gazelles and storm and save them. Yeah. He just eat what he need and go to sleep, you know? Mm-hmm. And we're so focused on, like, our brains are so interesting. Mm-hmm. The fact that we are, if we are fractals of the universe, that we're talking about it, that we are stardust. It's beautiful. It's incredible. Like, a dog don't know he's going to die. You know what I mean? But we know. It's just, it's hard to, like, sometimes it's like, do you do you understand what I mean by what if we are an accident? Like, uh, Yeah. You know, and, and you know what? I, I used to think that mm-hmm. all the time. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I got into geometry. Mm-hmm. And then I realized there are absolutely no accidents. Okay, so, mm, mm, so did some of us create the universe? And geometry, because because yes, it, it has... it's not some. All of us did. Okay. I, I it's funny because when you get deep into geometry, mm-hmm. okay, there's something called squaring the circle that I've spent a lot of time studying and trying to perfect. Okay. And the challenge is this: it's an ancient challenge. It goes all the way back to the Egyptian mystery schools. We don't have mm-hmm. the records of it from Egypt. We have the records of it from Greece, mm-hmm. but it was clearly from the Egyptian mystery schools. Maybe it's at the Vatican. Maybe it's at the Vatican. And by the way, I just got this invitation to go to the Vatican Library, so I'm like super uh-oh, excited. Uh-oh. I got when I discovered the prime number pattern a few years ago, 2019. Mm-hmm. I got invited by two uh, large groups, I guess, um, organizations, religions, you could call them. Uh, one was the Vatican. Mm. The other one was um, Dalai Lama. Mm. So in Dharamsala, India, so they made an invitation to come and teach. I got to teach the cardinals this prime number pattern. I got to teach Dalai Lama, His Holiness, mm. uh, the prime number pattern. Because if there's a pattern to something that's not supposed to have a pattern, mm-hmm. it's this whole idea of God's encryption, right? Mm. Then maybe it speaks to something larger about a spiritual something, right? Mm. And this concept, obviously, is something that's very important to these two large groups, and so they wanted to know about it. So I, I went, and when I went to the Vatican, I was like, "Can I, if I'm going to come there and speak, can I get access to the Vatican Library? I'm like, I got to go to the Vatican Library. Mm-hmm. And, um, but to be honest with you, I finally got the request. They're like, okay, what would you like to see in the Vatican Library? I'm like, well, how do you know, know what's in there? Yeah. What's in there? So I was like... You should throw them a shot. Like, 
it's just the contents of the library of alexandria yeah so, yeah i'm like uh, as whatever he's got on uh, egypt right whatever right. you've got on renaissance period stuff whatever you've got on the gnostics whatever you right. I, I, want, I, see, I want to see it all right yeah. on hermeticism but it's funny when you don't know what you don't know because you don't know what's in there right. you don't know what to say yeah. so i was like stumped last week i'm like what would i see okay so i had to really <laughs> stop and think about right. it but you know this idea of of this notion of who created geometry. This is a deep, deep question. Mm -hmm. Because once you get into squaring the circle, this challenge is that how do I draw a square and a circle on the same piece of paper without any measurements whatsoever mm -hmm. and make sure they have an identical area? Mm -hmm. So the square has the same area as a circle mm -hmm. with no measurement. And the no measurement part is critical. So they have these straight edges, right? It's like compass, which makes a circle, mm -hmm. and straight edge. And you have no way to measure because the straight edge has no lines on it. Mm -hmm. So it's like turning a ruler upside down mm -hmm. and using the upside down to do all the straight lines and everything so you can't measure it. Mm -hmm. There is a way to do it. It was encrypted by Leonardo da Vinci. It's been the subject of the TV show that I created called Codex. Mm -hmm. And it, it ties to an encryption of what the Great Pyramid actually is. Great Pyramid tells the story of Osiris. The Great Pyramid tells the story of his death and resurrection. The Great Pyramid includes in it symbologies on the walls of the King's Chamber that we discovered mm -hmm. and is the subject of this show. Right. And we're making a movie about it as well. Mm -hmm. The Great Pyramid has chambers that tie to the Vitruvian Man, which is that Leonardo mm -hmm. da Vinci right. you know, illustration that we all know, mm -hmm. most recognized probably yeah. in the world. And the horizontal lines he drew on it are matching the chambers of the Great Pyramid. So when mm -hmm. you place the pyramid on top of it, because mm -hmm. the pyramid is the only triangle that can perfectly trine or triangle the circle. Mm -hmm. It's the perfect proportions. As an isosceles triangle with that exact same slope angle, it's perfect. I mean, this is like genius level stuff. And I only discovered this a few months ago. No one knew this. Mm -hmm. So the point is, okay, What's really going on with geometry? Because the only way you can do this without any measurements whatsoever is to find inherent intersections of lines. And so you connect the dots, it's like playing a game of connect the dots. I'm gonna connect a dot here, connect another one here, another one here, another one here, and it's gonna give me a square that's exactly the right size that will be the perfect area of that circle, right? This is not easy to do. And it was the subject of competitions for thousands of years, literally. Wow. But here's the thing. It's possible. Da Vinci put it all in a cipher inside of the Vitruvian Man, in mm -hmm. one circle and one square. So he compressed an answer inside of it that solved not only that problem, but also had to double the cube, which is also one of the ancient impossible problems. Right. And not only that, but also solved how to trisect angles and how to try and how to also draw other prime number sided polygons like mm -hmm. heptagons seven mm -hmm. sides hendecagons 11 sides right 13 sides mm -hmm. 23 sides all of them all of it in the proportion of a square and circle all of it is found in there mm -hmm. so the thing that you have to ask yourself is who made sure that all these line intersections could exist who <laughs> I am that I am. Mm. We all are. It's a function of consciousness. Geometry is the coherence of consciousness into form. And all that we experience in the world around us is geometric. But how does it, how does it, if it's all of us, how does it manifest if most of us don't even know what geometry is? It manifests. So, okay, let's think of it like this. Let's say we look at this universe and let's say we're observing it from the outside. Mm -hmm. We're not in it. We're outside of it looking at it, right? Mm -hmm. So we'd look at this universe and we'd say, okay, it's kind of an interesting ecosystem, right? It's balanced. It's got an equal amount of entropy and syntropy. Syntropy is the opposite of entropy. Mm -hmm. Entropy is chaos, right? Mm -hmm. And it seems to like work like a pump in mm -hmm. a way, like it cycles back on itself. Mm -hmm. So it's self-preserving in a way, and it also is, um, it, it, it basically obeys the laws of conservation of energy. Mm -hmm. and, and so you'd look at it and you'd go, okay, matter cannot be created nor destroyed. So let's take a purely, 
left brain perspective on this and try to understand the universe from an outsider's perspective. So let's get into materialism because let's start to analyze this universe based on the material aspects of it, the matter. Mm -hmm. Well, the universe is only like, you know, 4% matter, not very much matter. Mm -hmm. And yet we choose to start from the matter mm -hmm. because we think in the nothingness is pure nothingness. Well, guess what? If you try to do a physics experiment to make a perfect vacuum of space, do you know that's impossible? Mm. You can't do it. Mm -hmm. Every time you get close to achieving a pure vacuum, you suck all the molecules of whatever is in there or elements out of it, one hydrogen atom shows up. Hmm. Where did it come from? It showed up from nowhere. Wow. It's almost as if as soon as you got to true zero, one pops out. Mm -hmm. How? So it can't exist. Well, guess what? Mathematically, mm -hmm. if you take the number zero and you take it to the power of zero, what do you think the answer is? It's one. Zero to the power of zero equals one. Mm -hmm. So nothing to the power of nothing equals everything. Mm -hmm. Think about that for a moment. Mm -hmm. So maybe we, should, we shouldn't be starting by analyzing the matter in the universe. Maybe we should start by analyzing what we think is nothing because therein, Inside of the nothingness is probably the answer to everythingness. Is dark matter that? I think that what we, what we believe is dark matter and dark energy mm -hmm. is actually just geometry. Mm -hmm. So Einstein actually said that gravity is geometry. He didn't say geometry represents gravity. Mm -hmm. He didn't say it can be described through gravity, right. or through gravity can be described through geometry, excuse me. What he said was, gravity is geometry. Is gravity? Gravity is information then. And that coherence of information is geometric. So information being a fifth state of matter, you could then say, then everything starts from information. That's why I don't really like to call it fifth state of matter. Everything starts from information and then branches off into liquid, solid, gas, plasma, mm -hmm. crystal. Right. Mm -hmm. There are different states of the matter that then right. come off of that information. But it all starts with mathematical ratio. And mm -hmm. that's what geometry actually is. So when we, when, we, when we look at the universe from a purely biologic perspective, we look at it purely from a chemistry standpoint, we forget that all of these things are totally connected. So what is applied mathematics? Applied mathematics would be called geometry. Mm -hmm. What is applied geometry? Well, we'd call applied geometry physics. Mm. What would be applied physics? Probably chemistry. Mm -hmm. What would be applied chemistry? Let's call that biology. What about <laughs> applied biology? Well, that would be like groups. So let's call that psychology or mm -hmm. individuals, mm -hmm. right? It's the, it's the behaviors, right. right, of that biology. Then what would be applied psychology? Maybe sociology. That mm -hmm. would be the groups. And what would be applied sociology? How about philosophy? And what would be applied philosophy? Mathematics. Mm -hmm. Do you see how it all goes in a circle? Mm -hmm. We've been learning all of these subjects as being wholly separate, defined, never the twain shall meet. You know, in ancient sense, the philosophers were not doctors of philosophy the way we think of them today. We think mm -hmm. of doctors of philosophy today as someone who yeah. has a very high degree of specialization. It's specific place. Very, yeah, if I wanna get a PhD in biology, it's really damn hard to get it in basic biology. Mm -hmm. I have to get in something that's super narrow. It's gotta right. be like nanotubule, whatever, right. whatever words, right. right? That we could throw into this. Or stem cell differentiation, you know, yada, yada, yada. That, you On know, a Friday. <laughs> Like very specific. You yeah, know? exactly. You know, stem cell methylation or something like that. Right, right. That's what it's going to be, right? Yeah. How do I take you know plural plural stem cells and right. differentiate them? That's that's going to be what the PhD I could get would be, mm -hmm. because it has to be in an area of new expertise. Right. I have to write a dissertation. Mm -hmm. But in the ancient sense, it was never never like this. Mm -hmm. What it meant to be a philosopher was it wasn't a degree that you would get. Mm -hmm. What it was was a path mm -hmm. that you would choose you would go through all of these different subjects that are all interrelated with each other, all interrelated. Mm -hmm. And like a spiral, you would travel through them, right? And as well as the arts. Mm -hmm. So the arts are all tied to this as well. Mm -hmm. Music is the opposite of mathematics. It's, mm -hmm. it's all connected. Yeah. And even the visual arts and sculpture, right? It's going to be tied to what we would consider like architecture. Mm -hmm. 
And in, in this context, when we start to see all of these things are super connected together, then even the way we separate ourselves from each other, a biologist doesn't like to be friends with necessarily with a physicist. Mm-hmm. That's why we don't have things as that get studied in universities like quantum biology, but they should mm-hmm. be mm-hmm. because physics is the underlying basis of chemistry, which is the underlying basis of biology. Right. We've separated it all out. Mm-hmm. So this is how you keep society from ascending. Mm-hmm. The way the ancient philosophers this, did it. Is this intentional? Yes. Yeah. By because whom and why? By us. Hmm. By us. Because we is wanted it, to really learn us, how to transcend it. Not like our conscious mind. We, we don't know. It's our... I think, all right, so the Buddhists believe, have a certain set of beliefs that most people on the planet... Um, will have to come back and do it again. They, they won't ascend, they won't reach that level of consciousness yet, right? Mm-hmm. So they're asleep, we could say, for a little while, and then they come back, reincarnate. And then there's a small percentage of people who get it and will ascend to the yeah. higher form mm-hmm. of consciousness, which they think is a star, which is interesting because stars mm-hmm. have a life like us, which is longer. Um, and then there's another small group of people who are like magicians, who are like, I guess it would be our politicians are, you know, the ones who know but manipulate the mass, right? So I would think that it's that group that's manipulating things and separating things and keeping people in the dark, wouldn't you think? I think that I can only speak from my own path. Mm -hmm. I believe that I came here to learn to expand my consciousness through difficulties and challenges. Mm -hmm that I actually chose, like a menu at a restaurant. Right. That this would be a experiential learning environment. And this experiential learning environment, because I realized that didactic learning doesn't really stick. Mm -hmm. It's experiences that stick. And if I'm really going to design a game around it, because by the way, I'm creating a game like this right now. Mm -hmm. I'm creating a game that will be a new game architecture, gaming architecture, right, in the digital sphere and augmented reality that will actually be considered a spiritual life simulation. Mm -hmm. And in the process of building this game, it has been very, very um, enlightening, let's say, to be in the the shoes of the creation process around it. Mm -hmm. Because what's the purpose of it? And if I could make a super real game, have you ever Mm -hmm. seen a Ready Player One? Yep. At the end, he's like, thanks for playing my game, (laughs) Yeah. right? And then everyone's like, whoa, that's kind of like a mind blower. You got the keys and all that jazz. Mm -hmm. Well, what if we decided to come here to experience what we're experiencing for our ultimate benefit? And we keep thinking in the process that, oh, the universe is happening to me. It's happening to me. It's happening to me. But the transcendent knowledge, the self-transcendence is the moment that you realize, wait, no, the universe has been happening for me. It's just the aim of the exercise was different than what I originally thought. Well, since if that's the case, is it safe to say from your perspective that this is somewhat of a simulation? Yeah. Yeah. You know, I watch the debates once a, every year. They, the, the, the brightest physicists, they all come together and debate whether this is a mm-hmm. simulation or not. Mm-hmm. I watch that and too. And none of them will, can say that is, it's not. Some of them say it's not likely, but it can be. They all say it can be. And um, I was listening to a guy the other day saying, you know, we're only, you're here only if I'm recognizing you and aware that you're here, right? Mm -hmm. And how matter is only present. It responds to observation. Correct. You know, I I saw this interesting uh, video last week on research that was being done on neurons, Mm the brain neurons and how they were like creeping and crawling to grow mm-hmm. and expand. And there, it's actually, you could see it, it's got like these tentacles and it's searching for another neuron. Mm-hmm. It doesn't know there's another neuron there, it's like blind. Mm-hmm. And it starts feeling around for it and the other one's feeling around for it and they finally touch and they connect and it's like synapse, mm-hmm. right? Bang, you have a new thought. New thought. Right. And, and so when I think about this and I realize that, mm, is this really just a simulation? holographic simulation um it's the most powerful thing ever because it changes the context of every experience i've ever had in my whole life and what the reason it was for why did i have it 
And by the way, this is exactly what all avatars through history have said. Go back and listen to what Buddha said. Go back and listen to what Jesus said. Jesus only gave two great commandments. Mm -hmm. It's very simple, right? We made tons and tons of other things on top of it. And yes, the Ten Commandments existed before then. Mm -hmm. But Jesus gave two great commandments. Love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, might, mind, and strength. And and love thy neighbor as thyself. Okay? And then he said, here's the caveat, judge not. Lest ye be judged with that same judgment you cast on others. Mm -hmm. This is the same concept he's teaching. Just love everybody. That's the purpose of being here. We all get stuck. Try to see. And in order for us to love everybody, we have to be able to step outside of our own lens of bias and see things not, we try to see things not as we believe they are because that's what we are, but rather as others would see it. So try to step into that consciousness. It's not easy to do. But why would we go through all of this? Because maybe the exact purpose of the universe is just expansion of perception. Mm -hmm. Maybe through this expansion of perception, we start to represent and understand how God sees the world. And this is how God can love the sinners and not love the sin necessarily. We all get stuck also in this concept of a God who is only good who's only light. Well, that can't be the case if there if God is what they explain God to be. I don't really like God. Yeah, exactly, because you know, it's like uh, you would think about it, it's like, things. wait, why would he put us through all this pain? Right. Why do why do we have people starving? Why do we right. have all these things happening? Yeah. Well, guess what? Well, what if? I had a friend um very religious, religious. Mm-hmm. Um very rich and they just they're into that the the uh whatever that world is called when they're giving a lot of money and doing a lot philanthropy. of philanthropy Phila- mm-hmm. no not not philanthropy it's only religious stuff though but anyway okay i don't know what it's called but anyway she was like you need to come to church i'm like i'll go every now and you know whenever mm-hmm. I, I don't have a problem with that and she kept pushing it on me pushing it on me, pushing it on me i'm like it's okay like let's not do that like well why not da, 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 da. i said all right because I don't want no parts like the God that you talk about that would that give gave you that special needs daughter. You know what I mean? What's the what's the lesson in that? You know, what's the lesson in bringing a, a child into a family that sexually abuses them, right? A child don't choose that, right? Uh, no conscious person would want to be born into bad situations. Right. Mm-hmm. Why 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 are people born with disabilities? You know. Why are people born in countries where it's constant war, you know? No thanks. Because the way that you describe God, he should be able to fix all of that like that. He shouldn't have a problem with a devil. You know what I mean? So I think that the way that religion is taught makes sense. Makes sense for the general public. Oh, yeah. To keep people in line. To be, you do that, you go to hell. Right? But once a person get a little bit of consciousness, just a little bit, it just doesn't make sense. And it'll give you anxiety. Like, why? Yeah. You know? I used to pray nonstop. Lord, please forgive me for this. Lord, please forgive me for that. You know what I mean? Just, I had to make sure I was, make sure I was ahead of my sin. You know what I mean? And, you know, the, the way that the Bible is taught is interesting because the way that the Bible is written mm-hmm. and the way it's taught is not the same. No. Right? And no, I, you know, definitely not. when people read it, they have realized like, oh, that's just, my pastor teaches it like that. You know, it's just a, interpretation of whoever is giving the message right Mm -hmm. he's it's his breakdown and people's breakdown of the word can be different based on where they are in life figuratively and literally you know but it's to me is literature's art to an extent and it's at the mercy of each person's interpretation but no people once again people they want to be guided that's just a comfortable state of nature and existence is to be efficient to not to think think much Mm-hmm. When when we were teaching my dog like obedience training, I noticed how tired he get just from having to think a lot. Mm-hmm. Thinking and you know, learning. You, I learned that you know the brain takes up like forty percent of the food we put in our body. Mm-hmm. So the brain is an expensive piece of real estate. It, it, it requires a lot. So you know, people don't want to think, and I think that's okay. That's just how it is. I think it's okay because it's so common. You know. So I do think it's a responsibility of certain people to guide people properly. What if, uh, let's say this. So let's say you know that there's no such thing as death. Mm -hmm. And you and I were making a game. 
Right. And in this game, there's no way to die. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you transition from one place to another, mm-hmm. but you don't really die. Mm-hmm. So just on that one thing, I think if I were you and I were sitting here talking, we'd be like, okay, we've done this a few times now. How do you want to die next time? I'd want to have some spectacular death. Yeah. Right. I want to like, go out go, with a bang. Go out with a bang. One hundred percent. Right. I, or I want to be climbing some huge mountain. I want to fall off the mountain and like 100%. come to a splattering. One hundred percent. One hundred percent. There would be a death. I want to just die, implode in space. Yeah. Right? So I want to experience all of it, which so is it weird. Changes it all, right? It's when weird, you start though. thinking about it, because you're like, wait a minute, I would choose this like terrible way to suffer in death, but if I knew that there really wasn't, because I'm eternal. Yeah, but the question would be what happens to your soul each time, right? Because here's what I don't want. I got to be honest. Mm -hmm. All right, so are you familiar with the story of the egg? Depends on what I've heard. The egg is fascinating. It's like, make a long story short, this person, you die, and then you have a soul buddy, I guess, that kind of guides you after Uh death. Just get you ready to go back out there again as a poor rice farmer in China or mm-hmm. whatever. But the, the moral of the story is treat people good because you are every person that ever have been and ever will be. Yes. So I don't want to do that. I don't want to live as a, a paraplegic. I don't want to live as a person in poverty, right? I don't want certain things, you know? But you know, it's interesting. Like- I don't want to be a woman. I know it sounds weird. I bet if we could talk to Helen Keller. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I wonder what she would say. Well, I think her life is good, was good, because one thing I know, of all of the situations that I've been in in life, I've always been all right. I figured it out. It it becomes normal. Mm -hmm. So, and, and I remember a story of a guy who was blind. He went blind when he was a baby, so he don't remember vision. And he ended up having a great life. He was a skier, professional skier, beautiful wife, children, all of that stuff, right? He was able to ski because he had a partner like ahead of him, like kind of giving him cues and he would use his sonar abilities. So he got a stem cell, could see, didn't like it. He preferred, he said, I was just so used to how everything was, you know? Yeah. So, so I mean, I your, your other senses change also. But I got this and I got my life. So I don't want to be beneath where I am now. But what if? So try to take that lens and just look through it differently. Mm. What if you were not looking at the world through your perspective, Mm -hmm. but through someone else's perspective, right? And that they wanted to experience it. Mm -hmm. You know, I could see myself. It's like, okay, I'd want to go down a ball of flames. I've lived through three plane crashes already. I have. Wow. And I can tell you that, I didn't want to die in a plane crash, so I didn't die in a plane crash. I don't know how I will die. Mm. But I will say that I think that we tend to look at the world as we are. And so therefore we make judgments of what other people would want if they were in the same situation. But if you went into Haiti and said to some of those kids that were out hustling on the streets, Mm -hmm. right, what would they want? They probably have some answers of what they would want. But if you'd say, no, no, I'm going to take you out of this place. Let me give you an example. I used to watch this TV show called Beverly Hillbillies. Mm-hmm. Such a stupid show, right? It's about these guys that, that like strike it rich yeah. because they, they strike black gold, and right? The hillbillies and they, they go out to Cali. Beverly Hills and they're living in this house and they're a bunch of hillbillies that moved to Beverly Hills. They're in mm-hmm. Bel Air. And, the, and this is the same story we see when people win lotteries, mm-hmm. right? People win Powerball mm-hmm. and they've got like 150 million. What always happens in the story? They go broke. Why? Because they don't know what to do. They don't know that life. They they're used to their old life. They they might indulge overindulge in vices and drugs or something like that, and they can't handle it. Or their friends that were their friends are no longer their friends because yeah. they felt like that they should have a piece of it, and yeah. they didn't give it to them. So they had battles over stinginess and mm-hmm. whatever, right? Mm-hmm. So this happens time and time again. Someone wins a lottery, they move to this expensive neighborhood, and then eventually they end up back in the old neighborhood. Mm-hmm. Because they didn't feel comfortable there. Mm-hmm. They didn't really want to be there. That's mm-hmm. not the life they chose. Mm-hmm. right? What if it's the same thing for us in how we live life and going to heaven? What if, okay, so if you imagine heaven as being like sitting on some cloud playing a harp, does that sound fun to you? No, nah, I don't see heaven like that. 
I see heaven, the way to heaven and hell, Mm -hmm. from my breakdown from the book, is now. Is you you live a good life, you make good decisions, you're gonna be in heaven. I feel like my life is heavenly. There was times that my life was hell, you know. So I feel like that is the the here and now. I hundred percent agree with that. Yeah, we are here in this place called Earth to decide whether through our own judgments of ourselves. It's not judgment day. It's our own judgments of ourselves. Constantly. Constantly. That creates either a heavenly existence for us Mm -hmm. or a hellish existence for us. Mm -hmm. The choice ultimately is ours. Mm -hmm. Now, the circumstances we come into this world in, I fundamentally believe we we get to choose. And I I would be thrilled to choose. Uh, I would choose the most challenging circumstance. What's Mm -hmm. the thing that's going to push me to the edge the most? Mm -hmm. What's the challenge that's going to be very, very difficult? And this is what Hindus believe. Mm -hmm. They believe that, you know, let me think of it like this. If you're a grasshopper, you live in a field, mm-hmm. right? We talked about this. Mm-hmm. Grasshopper lives only a few weeks, right? They're not like these long right. shelf life <laughs> yeah. biologies, right? Yeah. They're, they, they don't live very long. So they live in this field. To the grasshopper, the field could be in your backyard. The universe. Is the entire universe. Mm-hmm. The grasshopper dies, comes back, raises its consciousness, right? Becomes a monkey, lives in a jungle, right? In South America. Now it knows a panther, it knows a sloth, it knows mm. more diverse flora and fauna. It's got mm. more diverse experience than just the field. Right. But it's still limited because it doesn't realize that, you know, across the mountain, on the other side of the mountain, is Rio de Janeiro. Mm-hmm. Right? There's a whole city of people. Mm-hmm. It's never seen that city. Right. That might be an alien city to it. Right. It dies and comes back as a, a guy in Arkansas. Mm-hmm. Right. Never travels, never goes anywhere. Right doesn't know, he's never even been on an airplane, doesn't, has, haven't, hasn't had the opportunity to really meet people from other places much. Mm-hmm. So, you know, in a, in a town that has very little racial diversity. Mm-hmm. And so he thinks that, you know, those people of different, you know, an, a, an Inuit, right, mm-hmm. could be someone who is an, an alien to him. Right. Right? So then he dies and comes back as a world traveler. Mm-hmm. Been all over the world met with many different cultures, had direct experience, has been to fish in Alaska, knows how blue the sky is, Yeah, has direct experience with all of these things. Then he dies again, comes back. What would be the next level of ascension? Does that include now more flora and more fauna? Does that mean that extraterrestrials might actually come in? Maybe they're intraterrestrials. Is Maybe this, they've been here all it, along. But is this just our imagination? Because what if that, that is it? Or what if he's peaked? What if he became very wealthy, very learned, world traveled, all the, the high level friends, high level, high level conversations, high level living, right? And what if that's it, though? You, you don't, know, do you not accept that? I think it never ends. Mm. I believe that. So in Kabbalah, mm-hmm. Kabbalah, you're familiar with Kabbalistic yeah. sort of teachings, etc. You know, it's the Jewish mysticism. Mm-hmm. They have this thing called uh, the making of the golem. Mm-hmm. And it's a making a clay man. And a rabbi, when he reaches a certain level of a spiritual practice, mm-hmm. feels called to start making a clay man. Mm-hmm. So this clay man is a representation. It's a symbolism of God making Adam out of clay. Mm-hmm. And at a certain point, God makes the clay man, the golem, and then he breathes life into the golem, mm-hmm. and he, he brings him to life. Mm-hmm. And that man doesn't know that he's actually a part of the creator himself. He's just dropped here on earth, got to live this life, mm-hmm. until he becomes sentient of himself. In other words, he starts to realize who he is. Mm-hmm. And the first thing he does when he reaches that level of ascension is to make another clay man. Mm-hmm. Now, we see the advent of AI. A lot of people say AI is artificial intelligence. It's evil. It's, you know, it's manipulated. And yes, every new technology will have an equal amount of evil associated with it as it has light and goodness associated with it. Yeah. It's the nature of every action has an equal opposite reaction. So we, we could be the products of technology in that, if that's the case. All right, so now let me take you down the road to blow your mind. Okay. Our DNA... I actually patented this. I did something called a digital root analysis. You'll find it in the book. Okay. 
I did a digital root analysis of, of DNA of the nucleotide pairs, and I found nature's counting system. So nature has a counting system in there. It's the geometry associated with each of the nucleotide pairs, which are made up entirely of four elements, right? Plus one more if you include sulfur for the phosphate backbone. You've got adenine, thymine, which pair? Guanine, cytosine, which pair? If you add up the number of protons, which make up these, and the protons are divided into these types of elements, hydrogen, carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen. There is nothing else in DNA mm -hmm. except for this plus sulfur. Sulfur. So you've got hydrogen, carbon, so hydrogen one, proton, carbon six, mm -hmm. nitrogen seven, oxygen eight. Okay, mm -hmm. so those are geometries in and of themselves. But when you start adding up the number of protons that would be associated with the carbons and the hydrogens and the oxygens and the nitrogens that go into adenine and thymine, you start realizing they add up to a particular number. Mm -hmm. That number in mod nine arithmetic can be brought down to a single digit. So the way you bring it down to a single digit, let's say there were you know, 65 electrons or 65 protons, because the number of electrons and protons for all of these types of elements are all identical, mm -hmm. right? You just take that 65 and you take six plus five equals 11, and then therefore the answer is two because one plus one, you have to bring it down to one digit equals two. Mm -hmm. I found a pattern in DNA. Mm -hmm. When I did this, counted up the number of protons of the adenine thymine pair and the guanine cytosine pair, I found a binary code. Mm. Creates ones and zeros. Mm. Literally ones and zeros. Mm. And when you do transfer RNA, it creates this differentiation that allows for all differentiation associated with protein synthesis. Mm. Amino acids are formed. The codons come off of this. The codons, then amino acids, then amino acids to proteins. Guess what? You can predict exactly by the combination of ones and zeros of this pattern of the number of protons, nature's counting system. Mm -hmm. You can exactly predict what type of protein synthesis and therefore what type of genotypic or phenotypic expression will be expressed. Mm -hmm. So are you gonna have cancer? Are you not gonna have cancer? Are you going to be sickly? Are you going to be very healthy? Are you gonna be strong and have big muscles? Are you gonna be weak and not? All of it is determined by this mix of protein synthesis that happens at the DNA level, which is all a binary code. The same exact binary code that we use as computer language. Hmm. Wow. That's fascinating. Are you familiar with the, um, the string theorist, mm, I can't think of his name right now, that found binary code in the cosmos? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I can't remember his name. He's a, he's a black guy. He's a really yeah, smart guy. Yeah. And I'm thinking of him because he's like, the, the binary code we found on the universe and the cosmos it's error correcting was code. error correcting code. Yeah. yeah. It, and it's the same thing that's in, in DNA. So the, I'm telling you, I, I fundamentally believe that what we think of as reality is a limited viewpoint. And when we expand our perception of that reality, then anything is possible. Mm -hmm. Are you, how do you feel about what we consider death? Are you looking forward to it? You know, <laughs> I'd say I've always been a pretty grateful person. So mm -hmm. I feel grat gratitude in general Yeah. Um, about my life. And I've loved every single experience, even the difficulties. So when, when you're armed with this, new way of looking at the world. Mm -hmm. Then you start thanking the universe even for the difficulties you face. Mm -hmm. Because the only question for you to learn is why you chose it. Why did I choose this? What was the purpose? What did I, what did I intend to learn from this? What karma am I trying to resolve? Or you know, this series of circumstances that were created that led to me seeing the world in a certain unique way that now needs to be expanded in different ways. You know, I, luckily, I always thought to myself that like, geez, you know, I've been lucky. I've been lucky in life. You know, I could manifest. I've had a good body. You know, I wasn't like this super athlete or anything, but I was athletic. I, I, I could do things. I had talents. 
and I had abilities. And I used to think that my ability to, to create abundance and make money was because of all of my hard work, my ability to manifest for myself. And then I realized later on, maybe that was just part of the menu I chose for this life. Maybe, maybe I'm a Taurus. I'm a Taurus. Taurus and my sun sign. Taurus is about abundance. They're, they're, in, they're able to manifest. They're grounded, right? They're, they're not just up in the sky. So maybe all the stuff that I thought was as a result of my hard work and effort might actually have been in large part just because of the stars that were chosen and the frequencies that associated with my birth. So you, so you think that it's possible that at some point in our existence, we consciously choose our path, yeah. even though we don't remember it now. That's right. And what we start to remember as we go through the full ascension process mm -hmm. is why we chose it. And we start to remember, and it's beautiful. We start mm -hmm. to remember both who we are, mm -hmm. why we chose it, and all of our past lifetimes. Because transcending duality is the key to unlocking the highest level of the throat chakra. Right, so it's the highest level. There are three levels of the throat chakra. There's something called the lowest level would be self-aware or self-awareness level. Mm -hmm. The middle level is self-actualization. And the third level of the throat chakra is self-transcendence. Mm -hmm. Self-transcendence means you have to transcend separation and transcend the notion of duality. That, you know, making these judgments of this person's good, this person's evil. And rather stepping back, instead of making those judgments, stepping back and saying, if I looked at the world from that person's perspective, you know, I had this circumstance happen that was really difficult. One of the CEOs in my group of companies, he wanted me to meet his son. His son was 11 years old, and he wanted to go to med school. He's a super smart kid. His father was a CEO who had gone to medical school at Harvard, so a very, very smart guy. Mm -hmm. And his son wanted to meet me, so we had scheduled for him to come and meet with me later on, like in a couple months or something. But in the meantime, he went to go visit his grandmother in Sri Lanka. So the, the son was half Sri Lankan. His mother was from Sri Lanka. His grandmother's in Sri Lanka. The father was, you know, just a, a white guy, right? Mm. So he sends his son off for a week to go visit his grandmother in Sri Lanka. While he's there, he's sitting in a cafe in the Taj Mahal Hotel. Mm. A suicide bomber comes in, mm. blows himself up. The only casualty is this 11 year old boy. Now, Alex, because he had been an EMT, he'd been an emergency medical technician and a doctor who worked in the emergency room, you know, that's what his training ended up being mm -hmm. after he went to med school, uh, got a call from his grandmother and they're like, what do we do, what do we do? And the kid was still alive. Mm -hmm. And he's trying to explain how to reach into his chest, which was cracked open from shrapnel. They could see his heart. Mm -hmm. He's trying to explain to them over the phone how to massage his heart so he'll stay alive. Wow. Can you imagine having to experience that? I can't. And the helplessness you would feel, especially you were trained in that area. You knew you might be able to do something, but at a certain point, there's only so much you can do. Listen, like, I never knew love until my first child was born. So, and we're so connected, I can't imagine that. I mean, exactly. And so I, I called Alex, and he wept with me on the phone telling me the story for hours. And it was one of the most profound experiences I've ever had. And I had to think about it afterwards because I was like, why would someone do this? How is this good? And I, I, it forced me, it was so extreme, such an extreme case. It forced me to understand why did this suicide bomber kill himself? What was the reason that he thought? Because that's an extreme act all by itself. And the reason for it was quite simple. It was part of a jihad. Because you might remember in New Zealand a few years ago, so about three or four months before this happened in Sri Lanka, there was an attack on a mosque by a neo-Nazi. Mm -hmm. Right, who killed lots of people. I think it was around 50 people in this mosque in New Zealand. Mm -hmm. So the response, the retaliation, 
from the Islamic community, this jihadist part, sect within the Islamic community, was to have suicide bombers go all around Sri Lanka and kill themselves. And in this case, you know, all of these people that killed themselves were heroes amongst their people. Mm -hmm. So there's been a hijacking of the concept of jihad, because I'm Muslim. Mm -hmm. Not super religious, but that's, you know, jihad means... I, I, I know what you're going to say, okay. and I totally yeah. know that. But you it's, have what you have is, you know, unfortunately, if you look out, look throughout the world, the most religious people are the most uneducated people. So religion is everything. Yeah. And then you'll have people who are manipulating the poor people and giving families money for their sons. This is a great deal. Your son is going to paradise. And you have five thousand dollars. Yeah, three thousand. That's a lot of money to these people. So it's a no-brainer. And what people got to understand is this: we live in such a bubble of luxury. Even poor people here in this country, you know, in these other countries, like say, you know, I lived in the UAE, and my sister, you know, she does well for herself. She, her and her husband, they have driver, uh, cook, maid, and nanny. These people go, they're, the going rate is $300. That's good money. $300 a month for a servant. Oh, yeah. 24 7. It's at your beck and call 24 7. $300. They send that money home. They're balling, you know? So a little bit of money go a long way in these poor places. And like I was saying earlier, back to God, to most people, violence and money, you know? Who would give their, their son? Yeah. You know, one who fears the violence that may be inflicted upon them, but also one who need, whose money is their salvation. You know, oh, Unfor absolutely. unfortunately, I, 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 I kind of stand on God for most people is violence and money. Well, a big, you know, that's the thing. The universe is half bad, half good. Yeah, and that's, it, every, every, and everything it is that way. That way. And, it, and it, then you have to realize that. It's our perception that's polarized. Yeah. And our perception polarizes not only on that axis, it also polarizes on the axis of time. Right. And we separate that perception into past and okay, future. Let's, but let me, let me finish okay, the point okay. on this little boy, because it was such a travesty. But to us, you know, here, we hear the story and we're like, how could this ever be? And yet the family of the suicide bomber lauds him as a hero. Mm -hmm. They felt they had no choice. Mm -hmm. So who's right and who's wrong? The outcome, I think even they would probably agree. Well, look, that's not exactly the outcome we wanted, but you don't know. It's, it's sort of like collateral damage. It's unintended right. consequences. No one wanted to kill a little boy. Right. But the truth is, it's all in your reference point. It goes back to the, the, sh the shepherd on the hillside. We don't live in a world of angels. We live in a world of angles. A world where men speak of morals and principle and yet act on power principle. A world where we are always moral and our enemies are always immoral. We have to come to that realization within ourselves and reconcile with that. I, I, I'm starting to... I don't know if we can. I'm going to tell you why. Biologically, we are animals. Mm-hmm. Right, and we have coding, specific coding that all animals have. Mm -hmm. Hunger, satiate that. Um, procreation, lust, handle that. Right, <laughs> handle that. Nice <laughs> handle choice that. of words. <laughs> you know, every all of these, um, all of these primitive instincts or coding that we have, we have to express uh -huh. it. Right, so we are a little bit more advanced than all other creatures on this planet so we know how to plan right and be strategic and store for a rainy day right so if me having resources if right more resources to protect myself and my tribe mm -hmm. means taking from you and killing you taking from him killing him taking from to eliminate the competition I mean, that's literally the dominant factor in this planet, us, especially here in, in the United States, because that suicide bomber who did what he did and killed, I don't know if the boy died or not. He died, yeah. 
we do that times a thousand. We do. But it's okay. Collateral damage is going to happen. Yeah, we do some some bad stuff. Our our leaders, they Bro, say it, it, it's going to happen. It happens. They mm -hmm. don't they don't bat an eye. They don't feel bad about it mm -hmm. at all. And that's legal. That's right. So it's like, and we don't stand up against that. So what what really? How evolved are we? So you said something earlier that really impacted me. Mm -hmm. You used the word practice or the term practicing restraint. Mm -hmm. So a fighter has to, because he knows how to fight, has to learn how to practice restraint. Mm -hmm. You go to a dojo in martial arts, right? The whole thing is it's intended to be about defense, not offense, mm -hmm. right? Learning martial arts is, a, is a, in a way, a spiritual practice. Mm -hmm. It's an art. And I think what Jordan, Jordan Peterson recently said, which I found really fascinating, was he said, you know, for someone who's never learned violence, to practice restraint is not a virtue. Yeah, they're harmless. Right, so yeah. it's very easy for people in that context to be saying, no one should be violent, mm -hmm. and I'm practicing restraint. Well, you're, mm -hmm. you're not practicing restraint if you don't know how to be right. violent. Mm -hmm. So what if our purpose in life here in part is to learn all of these things and then to learn how to contextualize it and to practice that restraint? Mm -hmm. We can transcend it. Mm -hmm. We can. And, but you have to be able to learn to experience it at the same time too. You've learned how to experience fighting and everything. So you know how to experience that. But you mm -hmm. know how to be a loving father. Mm -hmm. You know how to practice. I know because you've told me. So, and I've seen it. Yeah, so I, my perspective is a little bit different. Me being a, a student of history, especially uh, combat, military history, and et cetera, like one, one piece of history that I really enjoyed learning about was feudal Japan. Yeah, me and too. And the, their caste systems. The and, daimyo and the shogun. Mm -hmm. and, yeah, and the warriors, they were, they were slaves, but it was a different type of slave. It was like, mm -hmm. my life's mission is you, you're my master. You hire me to protect you. That's my honor, right? So all day, every day, I fortify myself to be smarter, to be in shape, to have better technique, to make sure my blades are, uh, are perfect to, to honor you, to keep you safe. That's, so their life mission like was only that. Whatever cast you're in, that was it, right? Mm -hmm. So these people were so honorable with it. Their their violence was never used for entertainment like ours is now, right? That came later. But if you ever did something to dishonor your position, yeah. you take a special blade and you take your life. How to kitty? No, no mm -hmm. problem. I respect that so much, right? So they eventually rose to prominence with like the rulers. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, then the politicians came and, you know, whatever else happened. But, you know, me, I had I had periods of I started boxing at a very young age mm -hmm. and you know, I love it. I love I love that high level uh, problem solving and split second. Right. Mm -hmm. And all of the complexities of it. Now, I will always have instances of like, yo, this is not right. Like I'm doing this for these assholes out here. To be happy, yeah. Do you I'm like hurt, like in that I'm movie Gladiator? Are guy. you not entertained? Right. I, <laughs> I, I had a lot of conflict with yeah. it, you know, and there was a lot of things that would pull me away from it. Mm -hmm. But then I was good at it. But then I'm like, why am I gonna, you know, be hurting? My very first amateur fight at 12 years old, somebody died that night, and I felt no way about it because I was a kid full of adrenaline. This is my first fight. Somebody died that night. That's how dangerous it is, right? But outside of that, many, many men suffer from irreversible brain damage. Oh, yeah. They don't even know it. They don't even realize it, you know, and it's sad. But nonetheless, I've always had my own internal conflict with fighting to entertain people for money. Mm -hmm. It just don't feel good. Even though I like it as a sport and I support it. Yeah, it but okay, so let's put it in this context. So mm -hmm. if you were forced to fight someone who was clearly below your weight class, mm -hmm clearly did not have the skill you have. Mm -hmm. Would you take pleasure in beating the hell out of them? I need to know the circumstances. Like, why am I forced to fight them? 
Um, let's say it's 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 for sport, right? So, yeah. and, and normally you would be you would feel more comfortable, obviously, with like fighting someone who's going to be similar to you, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. Because it's not really a challenge for you to go up against a ninety eight pound weakling. It's not. That's very dangerous. So here's the thing. And you'd probably so be afraid a little hon- bit too. Like honest, I don't want to. The honest answer is I wouldn't take it easy on him. If we're in that, these are the rules. So I'm mm-hmm. I, I I'm going to always make sure I'm okay. Mm-hmm. Because what people don't realize is fear is an intelligent uh, character characteristic. It keeps us safe, right? And you know, the older I got, I start understanding how much I've been consciously using my fight or flight for certain things, right? So I have a thing. I developed this when I was I don't know how old. I think when I was starting to, like maybe fourteen, fifteen, when boys are getting bigger, mm-hmm. punches hurt a little bit more. Like guys would be kind of intimidating looking, and in the ring, like before before the bell rings, it's like all of the emotions right here, and I would I learned how to breathe it in and use it as fuel, because if not, you're stuck, you're scared, and that fuel made me destroy. Like I felt no pain. I walked. It's like my confidence was through the roof, and later on, I you know understanding breath work and understanding uh, the the com, how the amygdala works and how we can control that and how when we have that formidable opposition at whatever it is we rise to the occasion you know i use it to my advantage even when like when i'm writing scripts for content i'm like all right this is gonna be a good one i get my music you know and i i just get in my zone and i just go right so using that fight or flight even in training right i need difficult tasks to step up to it. You there know? you go. So that's where I was going to. Yeah. So it's it's you know a smaller guy. I know that that that's when people let their guards down. Don't try as hard. But I'm aware of that, so I wouldn't allow that. But unfortunately, in the context of us in combat, I would not take it easy on him. If I was fighting a handicapped guy, I wouldn't yeah. take it easy. No, on I, him. I understand it's, that. It is so, what it is. but let's go on this other point, which is. If you're lifting weights, you mm-hmm. have to get to a point to get the maximum return on your weightlifting exercise. You have to tear your muscle. Mm-hmm. Yep. You tear the muscle to make it stronger. Mm-hmm. So if you knew that that was the necessary aspect mm-hmm. for your spiritual muscle, mm-hmm. what would you do? Would you put yourself in easy you know, training wheel situations or would I, you I'll try to you. put yourself in increasingly challenging situations? This is, this is what I do actively. I still train physically because mm-hmm. it's hard to do, mm-hmm. and I I don't just coast. I go like I you go push hard, myself, right? right? Because that do, that does more than just make my muscles stronger. It works with my brain. It works uh, uh, psychologically as well because I know I'm formidable. And the things that we do on a daily basis and how we do it is who we are. So training is consistency, is discipline, right? It's a lot to stay in shape. Because our bodies just want to be fat and lazy. Yeah, We don't want to do much, you know. So wait till you get over fifty, man. I have to fight. I'm not far. (laughs) Not far. I have to fight against my nature daily. Reading, that's hard to do. Meditating is hard to do. Just taking five minutes out of my busy day is very difficult. But I know that fortifies me spiritually and mentally. So I make sure I do these things. You, You don't strike me as a person who takes the easy path because it's easy. I'm so look. I'm so good at difficult things. It's not even a problem. So then if you were designing your life through some sort of simulation in a game, would you choose an easy one? If I was, to be honest, if I'm designing my life, I would make my avatar super power, like to have all the attributes and not have to deal with that stuff anyway. But, I would, if, you knew, but if you knew mm-hmm. that the only way for you to get to those, the highest returns right. was to continue to tear that muscle okay, yeah. over would, and over and over again. I would again. give him a difficult life. Yeah, you yeah. give yourself a difficult life. So, so I can't just create him powerful. No, because the pathway is not something you can just all of a sudden be. Mm-hmm. You have to go through the didactic experience and the experiential learning mm-hmm. of it. So you have to what understand. If, but what if? Mm-hmm. I mean, that's our way. That That's how we've gotten to where we're at. But the world that we're creating with AI, with the nine CRISPR, with... If we could download information into a human. But you can. But wouldn't it be more efficient to just make them already have these 
uh, attributes and characteristics because that's what, what we're if? getting to. Okay. That's what we're getting so, to. So that book you have in front of you mm-hmm. is a book on all 90% new mathematics. Okay. Discovered. Okay. Math is a language of the universe. Mm-hmm. Math is not invented. It's only discovered. Mm-hmm. Pi is not invented. Mm-hmm. It's a ratio that exists in the universe. You have mm-hmm. a diameter. The ratio of the diameter to the circle is mm-hmm. pi. Mm-hmm. In a two-dimensional Euclidean plane, that's what it is. Mm-hmm. Okay. So where did all of that knowledge in the book come from? It wasn't learned in schools. You won't find the stuff in schools. Mm-hmm. What you're going to find is that what we think of as our brains, as storage devices of data and information, mm-hmm. like a hard drive storage, is wrong. Our brains are radio receivers. Mm-hmm. The tuning dial for which you can choose the frequency mm-hmm. is your heart and your emotional state. Mm-hmm. The higher you tune in a higher emotional state of happiness, abundance, joy, gratitude, then you can access the radio waves of information that are all around us all the time. If you're in a lower consciousness state or you're in a low emotional position, right? Because everyone has days where they go up and down. That's Mm -hmm. normal. But if you're constantly looking at the world as glass half empty, the messaging you're going to pick up on, the radio, the sympathetic resonance you're going to pick Mm -hmm. up on is going to be the frequency of I don't have enough and everyone else has more. Mm Mm-hmm. And it doesn't matter how much you have. Some people will never have enough Mm -hmm. because that's how they're going to see the world. They're going to perceive it as never having enough. Is that necessarily bad? I think that... Or a low frequency? I think that in general, done over and over and over again with that mentality, you'll just end up attracting more lack, more scarcity. Lao Tzu speaks of that. Yeah. Without a chain. So here's where I am. My life is that of an abundance, and it always has been. Mm-hmm. And I always want more. I never feel like I don't have enough, but I do desire more. So think of it like this, and I, and I, I will make this promise to you. Mm-hmm. Instead of thinking, I want more, try a different thing. Okay. Just try it once, see yes. what happens. Okay. Okay. Uh, but you have to do it in earnest. You have to do it with the right mm-hmm. intention. Try it from the perspective of, I already have more. And start embodying the feelings that you would have. So I used to do this thing. I like to buy watches. I have like mm-hmm. a ridiculous number of watches. I don't right. buy watches anymore. Right. But I used to buy them all the time. Right. Because whenever I'd wake up, I remember one time I woke up in Shanghai. I was with my daughter. She was 18, and I took her on a trip to Asia, just mm-hmm. the two of us. We had a great time. And I woke her up because I woke up that morning, and I was like, oh, man. I had this company that I founded became a unicorn. Mm-hmm. And I was like, shit, I got to get this thing. And it was chewing up cash like crazy. Right. It was like we had a burn of like $10 million a month. Wow. Which is a big nut. Yeah. Right. That's a lot to be able to raise. And you got to be really yeah. good at raising money. Yeah. And, and I woke up one day and I'm like, oh, man, I can't. I, I got to figure out a way to get this company public or I got to get a, you know, a major venture capital type investor. I can't mm-hmm. just keep fundraising. Right. Mm-hmm. And... And I felt like, you know, I woke up and I felt like the dragon was going to eat me, right? Yeah. <laughs> it was like, because mm-hmm. what companies, when they run into challenges, it's going to be usually because they run out of cash, mm-hmm. right? Any entrepreneur knows this. Yeah. So I've been very lucky in being able to raise to that point that we were good at it, we were super mm-hmm. good at it. But what was interesting about it is I woke up and my daughter and I said, hey, sweetheart, we're going to go to the Bulgari store today. Mm-hmm. And, and she goes, why? And I said, because I want to go and buy a watch. Mm-hmm. And she's like, why do you want to buy a watch? I said, I've been looking at this watch I want in particular. And I said, and when I'm facing a challenge that I'm afraid of or I'm fearing, I want to flip the script to transmute my fear into a different emotion. I try to do that first with gratitude and everything Mm -hmm. and abundance and all of that. But if it's still sort of lingering, I go and buy a watch. And why do I buy a watch? I buy a watch as a gift to myself for in the future, the thing I haven't accomplished yet, having accomplished it. right? So usually we have this delayed gratification where it's like, I'm going to buy myself a watch or some commemorative gift for this big challenge I faced, right. overcoming the dragon or the demon, yeah. spearing the demon. Mm-hmm. And instead, I flipped the script and I said, I'm going to buy the watch now and I'm going to burn the ships. 
It's right. like the concept of Cortez. You know, we may hate Cortez because Cortez did terrible things to the Mesoamerican mm-hmm. peoples. Mm-hmm. But one of the things he did do that was kind of like, wow, was you know, he came on six ships. And when everyone went to relieve themselves in the forest after they landed right on the coast of Mexico, mm-hmm. they come back out to the shore and they look and they see all their ships are on fire. Mm. Who burned the ships? Cortez, Cortez did. And that's when Cortez said, look, guys, there's 300 of us, there's 3 million of them, and they've got all the gold. <laughs> right? Mm-hmm. I'm burning the ships because there's no way home. Yeah. The yeah. next ships don't come for, year, for one year. That's, that's my mentality. Yeah. So I used to do this. I'd buy this watch. The reason I buy a watch is that I looked at my watch more than anything else all day, right? Because mm-hmm. it's like I'm constantly looking at my watch. What right. time is it? What time is it? What time is it? Every time I looked at my watch, I remembered the feeling of joy I had for having succeeded at the task I hadn't done yet. Mm. And by doing that, I learned how to flip the script to manifest that thing. Mm. And it always worked. Mm -hmm. It literally always worked. Wow. And it was like a burning the ship. And it had to be an expensive enough watch that it would sting if it didn't work. (laughs) You know what I mean? I get you. I get you. And and so I I guess I thought I was super confident. But I was always waiting until after the see, accomplishment. See, this I is like the thing. That. So now, when you think about the things that you want, mm-hmm. instead of thinking about it from the standpoint of, I don't have it, therefore I want it, mm-hmm. think of it from the standpoint of, I already have it. Mm-hmm. It's already mine. It's already there. It's already in my field. It's, I'm, I'm already abundant. Right. I'm already grateful that I have it. See, you can't tell me these things. I'll go overboard. <laughs> <laughs> so I figured you would. Yeah. But then I learned... I don't need to do that anymore. Mm-hmm. I had to go through that exercise. Right. And then I realized it's all preset. Mm-hmm. And I learned it through an exercise that I faced, which, which was like this big, big, scary thing. In 2016, I almost lost it all. And I came down to it. I had to raise $55 million in one day to retain control of my companies. Wow. In one day. Jeez. Everyone counted me out. I was down for the count. There was no way, because raising that much money mm-hmm. in a recessionary you know, kind of environment, which that's what, what it was. We had that flash crash in January of 2016. The IPO markets closed. It was a nightmare, mm-hmm. total nightmare. And I was in a marathon. Mm-hmm. And I had to raise $55 million in one day, and I thought it was impossible. Mm-hmm. And then somehow, I pulled a rabbit out. Mm-hmm. And threw the Hail Mary pass and caught it in the end zone. Touchdown. Right, wow. the very last second, the wow. very, very last seconds. Yeah. And it was one of those things that was like, we got so close to death mm-hmm. that even though it was a success and it was a victory, mm-hmm. victory, I felt like a failure. Mm. For stressing the people. Yeah, yeah, everybody was stressed. Half the people like lost it. They already mm-hmm. like went to the opposing side, yeah. you know, the, the mm-hmm. VCs and all mm-hmm. that jazz, right? Mm-hmm. And then I realized, wait a minute, why did I experience this? And it caused me, because so many people betrayed me in the process. Because mm-hmm. the VCs went to them and said, oh, you know, Robert, he's not, he's not the best leader to you, right? I mean, you kind of deserve more, don't you? Mm-hmm. And oh, oh, by the way, if you agree with our plan, then we're going to reprice all your stock options down to zero. Mm-hmm. And you're going to get super rich as a result of it, because you deserve to be super rich. Mm-hmm. Right? So all you have to do is agree with us. Remember, the world is not a world of angels. It is a world of angles. So when we think of it in those terms, I had so many people, about half, betray me mm-hmm. in the process. So when I succeeded in the end, they were ashamed. They were ashamed. How do you recover from that? So... I had to stop back and think for a moment. I'm like, I was so broken over the whole experience. In the middle of the battle, I couldn't think about the collateral damage that was happening. Mm-hmm. I had to just focus on getting the ball in the end zone. Right. Right. Just like you have to survive through the fight, mm-hmm. but you're not thinking about necessarily all the different things that are going out in the crowd around you. There's yeah. business dealings, whatever, right? All these things are happening. The people that you, you're close to that are betting against you in the fight. Mm-hmm. And you don't know this, but they think they've got it rigged or fixed. Mm -hmm. And for me, that was like this super heartbreak. So when it happened, 
it caused me to like question all my reality. Mm. That's when I dove into math because I was like, okay, what's the most objective of realities? The most objective of sciences is mathematics. So let me go back and question every assumption that I had. And my father used to always say to me, don't assume because that just makes an ass out of you and the person you're talking with, right? right? So I went back and I started looking at math. Does one plus one really equal two? So I literally reconstructed my understanding of math from that point forward mm -hmm. over the course of the next three years. Mm -hmm. And in the process, I discovered a ton of new math mm. because I'm looking at it with different eyes. We don't stop and think about math at this point in our lives right. very often, right. right? And I'm looking at it from a different perspective than the way a lot of the academics would look at it. Mm -hmm. I found patterns in it no one ever found before, mm -hmm. like prime number patterns. Right. And this was all so I could reconcile why I got betrayed. Then I had to learn why was I betrayed in the first place? And I realized it hit me one day because I wanted to come here and learn unconditional love. Mm. So if my goal was to learn unconditional love, how will the universe teach me unconditional love? It teaches us through the opposites. Mm -hmm. What is conditional love? Betrayal. Nobody gets betrayed by people they never cared about. Correct. They get betrayed you, by people they love. And those are the only people that matters. That, that they're the only ones that can hurt you. That's right. Yeah. So I had to learn through betrayal, mm -hmm. unconditional love and forgiveness. So did you, how, what happened with your relationship with the ones that betrayed you? Many of them, uh, we were able to come back mm -hmm. together because they had to see and feel that I really did forgive mm -hmm. them. Some of them never rekindle the relationship yeah. with. It's like, you know, screw me once, <laughs> shame on you, screw me twice, shame on yeah. me. Yeah. Right. And at the same time, I understand, but I still had to come to the realization of acceptance that someone could think of the world like that. Because I was like, you left me dead in the gutter. Yeah. And I didn't die. You know, it's interesting. I've had a fair amount of betrayal in my life as well. Um, and it's always at your lowest point. And it was so heavy for me because I've always treated everyone so good. And the people that were trying to betray me, they had no re in my mind, they had no reason. Because mm -hmm. all of their dealings with me has been as a benefit to them. That's kind of how I've architected my life. Like the people in my world, I don't even like saying this, but it's always me benefiting them. I prefer it like that. Because I don't know for whatever reason, maybe it's my own insecurities, but I want to always be giving, giving, giving in some way, yeah. right? Well, that's also why you're abundant because generosity is one of the key characteristics of an abundant person. Mm -hmm. right. the, the more stingy you are, the less money you will have. Right. Because it's the same concept. Right. You, you consider, it's like, you know, when the bill comes, everyone's like, yeah. Like if they're turning the other way or if they're grabbing it, yeah. the people grabbing it mm -hmm. are the ones that experience the abundance. Right, right. It's just true. No, for sure. So, you know, I, and I do things, it's like as if I'm trying to pay for loyalty. I can recognize that, you know. Um, I want people to be loyal to me because I'm loyal to them, right? And, you know, my childhood, we moved a lot, never had a stable set of friends. So when I got older, I would like, just love my friends. I love you guys to death. But it, it would always be something. But I had to understand, like, just human nature, you know. And then I have, I have a really good friend of mine. He's still my friend to this day. I love him to death. But we had a weird point in life where he, you know, betrayed me. And I was like, I never got too mad, though. Right? I kind of understood. I'm like, mm, how could you do that, bro? You could talk to me, you know. But me and Emma still like this to this day, you know. Um, we talked about the incident. It was some years ago. I'm good. I don't really hold things like that. I don't like having bad energy with people, you know. I think for me, I before that time, I think because I'm always a very positive person, mm -hmm. but I have incredibly strong willpower. Mm -hmm. And people have known. I mean, over the years, they'd say, "Don't cross him," mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So. It was like my philosophy in life was probably a little bit, that's why I probably got triggered by Donald Trump because maybe I had characteristics like Donald Trump. Yeah. Things I didn't like about him were things I didn't like about myself. And, but I had this philosophy of, you come at me with a, a gun, 
You know, don't don't bring a knife to a gunfight. Yeah. Right. Don't bring a, bring a gun to a cannon fight. Right. Don't yeah. <laughs> don't. I agree. I don't agree. bring a, a cannon to I, a cruise missile but I, fight. I think that's intelligent, though. I think yeah, it's intelligent. I it mean, is. But the, I also created this circumstance, and that and then afterwards, I had to realize that all of it happened because I desired it. Mm-hmm. I wanted to learn it. I had to experience it. I would have never gotten into. I'm so grateful to all of them now because I would have never, ever written that book. I would not be sitting in this chair. Mm-hmm. I can't look back on my life with regret or with you know worry that I made the wrong choices or whatever. Right. I look back on it and I say, everything was as it should have been. Right. I'm going to ask you a question. Mm-hmm. Tell me if this is wrong. So I was having a conversation about love and hate. And to me, love and hate is the same in, uh, energy. It's different degrees, degree of energy mm-hmm. on that spectrum. If you can love someone, you can hate them. Correct. I believe what you do with hate can be ethically wrong or not, right? So I said, I'm fine with hating people. And I said, there's not many people I hate, but there's, I, I thought of one person that I hated. And I don't want to love that person. And I said, I wouldn't do anything to that person. But if I see that person hanging on a cliff, I'm not gonna help them. I'm gonna stand there and watch until they they lose their strength in their hands and fall. <laughs> Is that bad? Is that wrong? <laughs> I'm not gonna step on their song. fingers. <laughs> I was watching this TV show. I was like drawing geometry the other day, mm. and there's a scene where this guy had like done this other guy wrong, and then there he gets confronted by the other person. They both confront each other, and one of the guys. It was really the bad bad guy in it. Um, ends up having a heart attack Mm -hmm. because he's like confronted with his shadow, right? Mm -hmm. And he's like, oh my gosh, I did do all this wrong stuff. And so the guy's like, "Uh, uh, uh." and like, he's like, help me call someone. And he's like, (laughs) 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 just watches, just watches the whole thing until Mm -hmm. like the guy's, you know, the life chokes out of him type Mm -hmm. of thing. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I can understand that. I do understand that. But at the same time, I know that for myself, Whenever I carry any of that, it's just a weight. And actually, the reason why I might hate that person is because I once loved that person. That, that is the case. And the person, you know, the type of betrayal was so Extreme. egregious. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So what if, just as a question, mm-hmm. what if when you came to this place, and you chose it all in that context. You wanted the most challenging of circumstances to have this epiphany in life that's going to be this super climactic moment. And actually, you then learn that you both chose it together. Mm. You know, I, I went to go see this uh, play, Phantom of the Opera. A lot of people have seen it. I've seen it a few times. The Phantom is kind of like a hero and a villain in the play. There's an aspect of him that's like amazing. His talent and everything is freaking amazing. But there's an aspect of it. And he wears this yin yang style mask. It's the shape of yin yang. And the girl, Christine, Christine Daae is her name, she in a way falls in love with Phantom. Not necessarily in the romantic way, but more in a platonic sense. And he falls in love with her. Yeah. And, and he's a villain in the end because he's mm-hmm. trapped her in this dungeon and he like kills the guy on the stage, right? There's all these villain things that he's done. But in the end, you feel sympathy for him. You feel empathy for his position because mm-hmm. he was born this, you know, with this face that was mangled. And yet when we see at the end of the play and all the people come out to take their applause, mm-hmm. you clap the most for Phantom. Mm. He was the villain. I go back to this violence, money, God. Mm-hmm. And here's here's my reality. The way that you know the circumstances of my life made me a very strong person, right? The circumstances of my life gave me a, 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 a undying will as well, right? With all of that, it's a lot of love in me, a lot, a lot of generosity. No, I feel it. But there's also a lot of hatred in me. You've got complexity. Yeah, 
And I've been in love before and a woman telling me something happened. I, n I never antagonize nobody. I don't bother nobody. But when it comes and I deal with it, right? And she said, we're leaving. And she says, I love how evil you are. And I love that. I'm going to tell you why. Because in my twisted mind, I'm like, yes, you're the most safe because you got the most capable man, right? Of the good and the bad, because it's a lot of bad out there. And if I can't match the bad, then I'm a victim. And they can take you, take everything I have, right? And I'll never al allow that because I'm worse than them if they activate me, you know? But that was also why she, like, like I've never raised my voice at a woman. But it could be violence and my, my just not saying anything and just, you know, an intimidation of just like you can feel my disdain, you know, and I know it. I know. I know I got that. Right. And the thing that she loved is also what she hated, you know, and I that was hard for me to deal with afterwards. I was like, you, you, you fed that, you know. Yeah, and I've been in other situations when a woman feeds that, that the phantom side, you know. No, we all have and the shadow side, and they don't respect the nice guy side. I see it over mm -hmm. and over and mm -hmm. over. So it's an interesting dichotomy, and it's an interesting dance. This is why I say, ultimately, no one's any better than anyone else, mm -hmm. because I believe the most important aspect of ascension and transcendence of duality is to start to learn to accept your dark side. Mm -hmm. You know, Carl Jung said, it's not by changing your darkness to light that you become mm -hmm. enlightened. You become enlightened by bringing awareness of your dark side mm -hmm. and learning to accept that. And the more you learn to accept it, the more you can restrain it. Mm -hmm. it's, it's the people that are in denial that it exists. Right. So the people that I'm worried about are the ones that say, I'm only good. Yeah. I don't have a bad bone in my body because <laughs> they're the ones doing usually the most bizarre stuff, right. even unaware of them. It's like, it, it's, it's basically, I was laughing today. Someone was saying to me, oh yeah, the people that are easiest to corrupt and were easiest to corrupt in high school were the ones that were the most religious, mm -hmm. right? It's the, the, especially when it came to like sex and stuff like right, that, right? right? So this whole way of we of we, how we see ourselves becomes a microcosm of a macrocosm. It's correspondence, right? Hermetic mm -hmm. principle of correspondence mm -hmm. that it reflects all around us. Mm -hmm. So when we can realize that we can love and that love can also turn to hate and that there's a dark aspect in each one of us, mm -hmm. then we can actually do something about mm -hmm. learning to restrain it. What do you do? All right, so when you're dealing with that energy of love, that frequency of love, and it is, it gets offended and is going away. Mm -hmm. And then there's a lust to show hatred. I know I have it. Mm -hmm. I want to be mean or I want to not allow or I want to express hatred in some way. Yeah. How does one satiate that without expressing hatred? So I think do you understand the, what I yeah, mean? Yeah, I do. I do. I think that um, one of the hardest things for people to do is to allow themselves to feel their negative emotions. Let's say you're grieving. Mm -hmm. You go through a really rough breakup. Mm -hmm. You're really in love with somebody. The more you repress your feeling for that, and so let's say you decide you're going to go on a bender. Mm -hmm. After you break up with this girl, breaks up with you, you're heartbroken over it. So the best thing you can do is sort of like, you know, surround it with noise, bring in other women into the picture and sleep with a bunch of girls. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, I think maybe that's happened before with some people. <laughs> Who knows? And actually you're hurting inside. Mm -hmm. And all you've done is repressed your actual feelings because you've tried to replace that love with hatred. Mm -hmm. And it's easy to flip to hatred. But by mm -hmm. the way, just as it's easy to flip from love to hatred, it's easy to flip from hatred to love. If you allow yourself to feel those negative emotions and let them kind of wash through you, it will do a lot to reducing 
the intensity of that negativity. Mm. If you try to repress it, it will come back on its own. It's like, you know, we all seen the story of like the werewolf who like wakes up covered in blood the next morning and yeah. is like, I killed again. What the <laughs> right, hell? Right. right. We all have this inside of us. We right. all have a dark shadow character. And in Carl Jung's alchemy, right, and psychology, mm -hmm. and Carl Jung was a protege of, uh, of Sigmund Freud, mm -hmm. but he kind of repelled Sigmund Freud in a way because Sigmund Freud was very much about man's, you know, base needs are carnal. Everything's about, you know, kind of Oedipal complexes and all these strange sort of like father, mother, child, father, child relationships, mm -hmm. right? And... And then how that leads to more complex psychological pathologies. Mm -hmm. Well, when you actually look at Carl Jung's approach, which was more in the line of where Maslow's hierarchy was going to go with self-transcendence, he coined the term Aeon, A-I-O-N or A-E-O-N, uh, and he wrote a book called Aeon, which basically means individuation. Individuation is to transcend individuality. And yet individuation sounds like it's related to being an individual. It's realizing that you're both an individual and the collective at the same moment in time. And the only way you can do that is learn to start seeing a world, not in terms of duality, but in terms of a facet versus a fact. You need the wisdom of the owl, the owl that turns its head, that 271.8 degrees, which is the Euler number. And you said, oh, that's weird. The wisdom of the owl turns facts into facets. And you start realizing that, wait, I don't know what I don't know. The more I learn, the less I actually know. And that is the path of wisdom. But feeling emotions, allowing them to wash through you, uh, being aware of that is nine-tenths of being able to mm -hmm. overcome the negative consequences that can overtake and derail your life because someone you love betrayed you right what's up we're not uh, all right well sir this was a pleasure i don't want to take My up too pleasure. much of your time actually i do want to take up all your time but i'm not gonna thank you so much for coming on and maybe we could run it back thank soon. you yeah I'm looking forward love to, to Kemet or egypt yeah we're February. doing egypt together it's gonna be epic you're gonna yeah. have an amazing time uh i will have an amazing time with you I plan to just go and observe, not say nothing. So yeah. I think I think you're. I I can't wait to see your face. I'm gonna have you lay down on the sarcophagus. Mm. Anyone that feels that and how that resonance frequency, you find the right frequency, mm. just go. Mm. Right. Then that whole chamber goes. Whoa, 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 wow. whoa! It like turns on. Wow, it's freaking amazing. Wow. It's. I can't wait till their level of technology is being. We understand it. And we see how how advanced they were. It's happening right now. Mm -hmm. We are literally in a global awakening because we're all tapping into this field of knowledge as we raise our frequency right. and starting to remember more and more who we are, mm -hmm. why we're here, mm -hmm. what is our purpose. Yeah, and it's beautiful. Yeah, because that transcendence is world changing. Be the change you want to mm -hmm. see in the world. It was interesting, real quick, about them with the comedic mystery system they always had the esoteric attached to mathematics everything yes, else it's all we don't have that anymore and that's what needs to be yeah exactly yep. so that book and and on this trip you're going to see what we do is we have an egyptian mystery school mm -hmm. we have an incredible faculty get a close-up of that yeah mm -hmm. uh we have an incredible faculty you're going to love them all mm -hmm. and that's what they teach mystery okay. teachings yeah Thank you so much. Thank you. All righty.